Greetings from the north, all citizens of the world, welcome to Forum Borealis, and another episode in our series on antediluvian civilizations, this time from an esoteric perspective. You know, in the intro jingle, Bella announces paradigm expansion, and today this is probably more so than usual. Now remember, in, in classical education and uh, formation, you don't have to believe in, identify with, or even fully comprehend all and every new knowledge you absorb. In fact, uh, knowing about, about matters, especially those that may be strange, alien, or even contradictive, to whatever stands you currently hold, is in itself a contributor to greater wisdom. You just approach it phenomenologically. And in fact, if you're really wise, don't posit any stance at all, unless you are completely and utterly certain of its truth. And at the end of the day, how much can you back to such an extent? Now, leave it to fools and fundamentalists to do that, and let us rather have inquisitive, curious minds exploring what we don't know, uncover what knowledge exists, no matter to what extent we find it agreeing with our temporary paradigm. With this caveat, tonight's program can be better appreciated, because even if you realize that we had advanced civilizations in our dim, distant past, now long lost, our mysterious origin, according to the esoteric annals, may still appear outlandish, outlandish to you. Or perhaps you recognize aspects of truth to some, if not all of it, and even if you don't take any of it seriously, at least you're better informed. And if you, like me, find this subject deeply, profoundly and existentially interesting, at a minimum you'll be entertained, with no required judgment, and that's what we do. Not evangelizing, as rare as it is. We merely present you with different aspects of marginalized knowledge for your consideration, to the benefit of your education. What you take away, what you do with it, it's up to you. And by the way, esoterica is a vast field, so tonight we're mainly referring to the theosophic version of it. Or even more specifically, we're relating what the prehistoric and immemorial collection of documents called the Stanzas of Zion has to say about our extremely ancient history. Helena Blavatsky, founder of Theosophy, acquired a version that she based her book Secret Doctrine upon. And there are others still found in distant Tibetan monasteries. To help us decode and relate the incredible, complex and exotic doctrinal system contained herein, we converse with Philip Lindsay, who's studied the matter for over 30 years. He's not an academic, but certainly a scholar from the School of Life, having travelled to all corners of the world, and you can follow his travel blogs at his website. Lindsay was born in Indonesia by Australian parents, grew up in Tasmania and educated at a Quaker school. In line with a true practical explorer, he's held all sorts of jobs from bartender to masoner to taxi driver to name some. But his theoretical formation and education has been through various spiritual, esoteric and theosophic groups. And he has also had the librarian's advantage by working in various famous metaphysical bookstores like the Sydney Esoteric Bookshop, Adyar Bookstore, and even the legendary Watkins Books in London. 
He is the author of 12 books on the ageless wisdom, astrology and esoteric history and has been writing monthly newsletters continuously for the past 10 years that represent a practical application of the ancient science of esoteric astrology like a commentary relating to what is happening in the world today, politically, culturally and spiritually. He is running courses, seminars, webinars, astrology readings, online as well as all around the world. One of his main passions is the Hidden History of Humanity project, which takes him to many places to acquire film footage for his documentaries and to allow these ancient places to speak to him about their past. The first documentary in this series is now available online for free, and today's conversation is based upon this film, as well as his most recent book called Unveiling Genesis, Mysteries of the Root Races and Cycles. Today I'm joined by something as exotic as an esoteric astrologer. And I'm talking about Philip Lindsay. Welcome to the Forum, Philip. Thanks so much, Al. Good to be here. And it's great to have you because I'm impressed by your work. I have to say before we begin, I have to give you some due. You have out there a film called The Hidden History of... What's the name again? Mankind? Humanity. Oh, humanity, right. Mm. And uh, it's actually a two-part so far, I understand. It's going to be more. There's a two-part two version on Vimeo, and the whole one part is just on, on YouTube. On YouTube, okay. So what is so great about it, apart from the obvious things, is that it's probably the best condensation introduction dare i even say dumbing down <laughs> of the of the esoteric lore to the masses it's actually a way mm -hmm. to 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 watch it and understand it and 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 that's always been a challenge with uh, those sources that you're using uh, for most people it goes over the heads especially the books so yes. I, I was impressed by your ability to to make this tangible and also it's a very meditative thing yes you best be watching it when you're not in a rush yeah like i watched uh, most of it uh, on the airplane mm -hmm. over the atlantic so uh, it's excellent for that yes. so uh, yeah well done uh, man well done thank you. thank you yes it was a labor of love and um we we recorded most of it about six years ago in los angeles but um we didn't get around to really putting it all together till the last um the last 12 months Right, and um, I always stated that uh, if anyone wanted to to look into my big thick book called The Hidden History of Humanity in the Evening, or watch a video, what would they choose? And I'm sure that most of them would choose the latter <laughs> video, less far less painful than the book. <laughs> it's it's true, but at least <clears throat> our show is kind of like a book review program, uh -huh. so we have a lot of bibliophiles, even uh, at least we have more than the average show. Uh -huh. So I'm sure some of our listeners will be interested in your book itself, So, and they, I guess they'll find it on Amazon? Yes. Just on that score too, Al, um, yes, you'll find it on Amazon, and it'll be half price soon because I have a new version coming out, which will supersede this one. This one's 424 pages in uh, letter size format, quite a large book. <laughs> but the next one is going to be slightly smaller format, but 641 pages. And I've spent the last couple of years completely rewriting it because it's been wow. uh, about 15 years since I, I wrote the original one. Mm -hmm. And I've put prolific amount of pictures, diagrams, tables in it to really, really try and tease it right out as far as the explanation goes because it's a very complex subject yeah, so i'm very excited about this and it should be ready in, in the next four weeks and available on amazon then that's great um, oh, and it's been renamed too i should say it's called unveiling genesis mysteries of the root races and cycles i mean why not just make it as a separate book well, it is. That's what I'm saying. This is a separate book. It's been rewritten. It's more than just a new edition. Yeah. It, it, yes. 
it, it's so in fact people would need both then if, well if, uh, yes and no need... because the the first book actually is divided into three sections of which genesis the interpretation esoteric interpretation of genesis is the last section hmm. but what i've done with this new version i've ditched the first third of the original book and extensively rewritten and added to the last two sections right so um and, and essentially it's a, it's a synthesis of Eastern and Western teachings, even though it's using the, the Genesis template <clears throat> mm. to interpret esoterically human history. It draws on the secret doctrine uh, extensively, and therefore we have a synthesis of Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Judaism, Christianity, uh, all those, those old traditions yeah. Um, yeah, uh, unified. Right. That sounds like an interesting, interesting approach. Uh, I, um, due, due to how you solved it in your articles and video, I'm convinced uh, that's going to be a great reader to the books. I hope so. I'm, I'm quite excited about it. And I'll, I'll be doing extensive webinars probably afterwards for the next few years for people who are attracted to it, because I think there's a whole new readership now. Yeah. It's a huge interest in this uh, subject, and, and mm. uh, in addition to that, it's also people also waking up to the esoterica. So it's a hit uh, as for the timing. We'll we'll link everything uh, on your presentation page when we get mm -hmm. that up. Okay. So you after the show, you you provide me all the necessary links. Very good. Yeah. Now, like you said, it's it's a very complex matter, and um, so we'll not even pretend we're gonna decode or. <laughs> communicate everything in this show but what we'll try to do we'll give them a teaser we we'll clarify a few aspects of it and we'll show them how deep it goes so that they can follow it further on their own those who are interested uh, yeah. and if nothing else people will be entertained <laughs> i'm sure i hope so yeah so let's start with uh, <clears throat> I guess we, we should start with timelines. That's a huge yeah. thing. And uh, most people are familiar with stuff like the Mayan calendar. And yeah. uh, people also know about the old Indian lore. And uh, uh, at least those who are a bit educated will also know the, the philosophic, the Greek, ancient Greek approach. I think those three sources are... Yeah. Would you agree that those are probably the best surviving sources for? Yes, I, I would say the the Hindu the most because it's really the mother of all the other races that have come come forth, you know, the Greeks and the Mayans included. Mm. Um, so, uh, in my books, for instance, I have the the Hindu sub race as the first sub race of this fifth root race that came forth about a million years ago, which is extraordinary chronology for most people to, to wrap their minds around. And they had Hang on, hang on. Uh, you're already introducing terms like root race and sub race, and that's something we should clarify. Yes. Uh, but and I don't think we can explain the whole, uh, all the details of, of the race thing, but let's just give a general understanding. What does a root race and a sub race mean? Well, uh, according to the esoteric law. Yeah. Well, one explanation would be that that um, since humanity started to become a, a evolving conscious souls on this planet, and we can go into this later, yeah. um, it, it evolved its consciousness through through three major root races: the Lemurian root race, the Atlantean root race, and this current fifth root race, which is also called the Aryan root race. And, of course, Arya is a Hindu word, and, and Arya, or, or India, ancient India, is the mother of all Western nations. Yeah, Iran is actually uh, the Persian word for Arya. That's right. Arya. It, it, uh, Persia was one of the most Western extent areas of, of ancient India. And so mm. there are five major sub-races that have come forth um, since that period of, of ancient India, uh, including the ancient Egyptians, the Mayans, the, uh, the Semitic, the Celtic, Latin, and finally the, the most recent, the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Teutonic, Germanic. Mm. So it's fair to say then that according to the esoteric lore, yeah, mankind has manifested on earth through what's called root races, but, but no one is a root race because every root race has 
divisions. That's right. That yeah. you call sub races. So sub race doesn't mean that it's undermensch like it. <laughs> like it no, no, it's no, just it's, it's just it's a cat. It's just a if if a root race is a cake, yes. Then a sub race is a piece of that cake, right? Yes, or even better analogy would be a, a tree with a major trunk, which right. is the root race. The the main branches coming off that trunk are the sub races. The uh, smaller branches coming off those branches are the are the branch races, and the leaves on the tree are the nations. Right, and they all have particular cycles of time that they they unfold in, according to these cycles that you first asked me about, which are all based upon the astronomical precession cycle of the zodiac of 2160 years. Yeah, we'll get back to the race thing and we also before some oversensitive people start getting ticks, we'll debunk <laughs> the racism aspect later and also if some supremacists are listening, <laughs> don't get the hard on because we'll debunk it. But back to the point, yeah, you were saying <clears throat> that uh, uh yeah, the timeline because mm. I I don't know if you you probably read Professor Jocelyn Goodwin. Yes, years ago, I loved his stuff. Yeah. yeah, he's he's done. I almost have all his books. And he, yeah. before I discovered you, he was the first I found that attempted with some kind of success, some kind of convincing to to fuse these timelines because they appear somewhat confusing and and uh, disparate. But you actually have managed to. Uh, make a version that makes them fit right and uh, yeah. meaning also that you've uh, introduced then um, an explanation for for instance when is the age of aquarius people have been quarreling yeah. about that ever since it was introduced yeah. could, could you just uh, try to clear up that mess well i have an essay on my website called 2117 and that is the date of the common era coming up in the next century or so when the sun technically, astronomically, precesses into Aquarius based upon a passage that I quote in that article and um, which is the beginning of the next 2,160-year precession cycle for Aquarius. Right. But, of course, we are on the cusp of that age right now since since the 1700s, late 1600s, early 1700s, which is about... So the Renaissance was actually the first... Well, in a sense, the Renaissance was the, the, the first... Um, part of the yeah of the cuspal 500 year cycle that usually um bridges each 2000 year cycle to the other but technically we're still in the piscean age technically we're still in the piscean and and yet also you know we're in the aquarian if you're if you're responding to those frequencies of aquarius which are certainly influencing us now right so we have three groups of humanity and the majority is still in the age of pisces Hmm. Uh, a few in the age of Aquarius, and then there's a kind of a, a, a group in between those two. Uh, is it r correct of me to interpret it as that those who respond to the new vibrations are probably a bit more refined in their consciousness, whereas those who are still bogged down by the old are not that refined? Uh, and so that if you're manifesting more Piscean energy today, you're... Hmm. I mean, when, when, when we lived in the age before the Piscean and when the Piscean age started to come, if you responded to that, it would be the best of the Piscean. Whereas if you respond to it today, it's the worst of it. Is that... Uh... Yes, yes and no. I mean, I think, you know, uh, generically what, what you, your, your statement is true, but there are still many f very refined qualities of Pisces that, that are waiting to be expressed. Right. In many ways, there are large groups of humanity who haven't really been through the Piscean Age yet. They oh, actually right. haven't got the, the message of, of love, wisdom. You know? <laughs> right. and, and we're going into the Aquarian Age now, and they've, they've almost bypassed from Aries to Aquarius Jeez. without really getting the message of the Piscean Age. And this is a real concern. <laughs> yeah, they're hanging. They're, they're so left behind. But um, it's, it's, you know, the things are accelerating so quickly now that... that um, a lot of these people are catching up and waking up, and that's why there is so much conflict on the planet at the moment. We are not only in the cusp of two um, astrological cycles, but also in the cusp of two ray cycles, the cycle of the sixth ray of devotion and idealism, which accompanied the Piscean Age, 
and the cycle of the seventh ray of ceremonial order and magic, which is the cycle that will that will correspond with the or overlap the Aquarian cycle. Right. So, hey, I think we should keep the race out of it uh, for now. But, but this know, is, poor listener. Yes, but this is short-term history, really. The, the hidden history of humanity is really about the long-term history, starting way back yeah. at individualization. And uh, perhaps we can discuss some of those, what actually happened. At that time. Well, I'll ask you about the race, uh, race as in beams, if people... You know, we're not talking now ethnicity rays. We're talking beams ray mm. array. We'll we'll talk about the seven rays. Oh, the rays, as in race. Yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah, because because we have um, the words sound so similar, race and yeah. race. Yeah. So um, ethnicity race is where we are at, and the uh, root races. And we'll get later back to the well, beams. Well, actually, this is the thing we need to discriminate too, Al, because. The race, the root races are essentially about consciousness, not necessarily ethnicity. Oh, okay. Okay, so we uh, and I'll, we can talk about this more later when we discuss the eastern and western races. Yeah, but back to the timeline then. So, yeah. um, so we, we are approaching Aquarius, and people will notice that it's going backwards uh, through the zodiac yeah. that we were in the areas. I guess you could say, is it is it true, this old, um, in many esoteric books, you'll see they say that, for instance, the Egyptian civilization was a manifestation of the age of Leo, and that's why they had, like, uh, the cats were holy and, and the sphinx were originally a Leo. Yeah. They say that the Hindu was from the Tauran race, and they that's yeah. why our oxes are that's right. holy. They say that... Moses, when he introduced, you know, they, they were dancing around a golden calf because they mm. uh, didn't, uh, they were still on the old Tauran instead of moving on to uh, yeah. the Aryan. The, the lower Taurus sort of worshipping materialism. Exactly. And then, and then also you have that Jesus, who was an avatar connected to the Piscean Age, mm. uh, the original symbol of the Christians were Pisces. And yeah. uh, and they also talked about follow the uh, man who um, carries the water. Aquarius. Yeah, Aquarius. The picture of water upon his shoulder. And, and this is accurate to a degree, but it is based on the paradigm of short-term cycles and not the long-term mm -hmm. cycles. For instance, you can say that, yes, Egyptian, the age of Egyptian, I uh, corresponded to Leo and the cat. That's a very kind of superficial thing, but um, that's only 8,000 years ago. The Egyptian sub-race came into being 800,000 years ago mm. and uh, by my chronology in the Age of Wisdom. So it's not really that accurate, but the the most recent ages of with Moses and the, the worshipping of the golden calf uh, the uh, and Jesus of the Piscean Avatar is entirely accurate. Mm. I think we can look at a previous avatar called Mithras, who uh, in ancient Greek times, around about 8,000 BC, I think he was uh, corresponds to the age of Gemini. Oh, really? Mithras, Gemini, not Arius. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, Gemini. And he oh. he, uh, he was a Christ-like figure and probably held the, the office of what we call the Christ at that time and spoke in a universal language of music. Mm. Yeah. As well. Yeah, because many many researchers who are into the ancient antediluvian, uh, they point to a technology based on sound. Yeah. They say that stuff was built by um, resonance and um, advanced fine-tuning right. instruments. Yes, I state this in my article and in, in the video. Um, these, these have been magical formulae that have been gifted to humanity <clears throat> since the beginning of time right. and they're gifts that have also been taken away from us because we've abused them. Hmm. So in ancient Lemuria uh, was when they first started to use these, <clears throat> um, excuse me, um, formulas which basically created a vacuum and allowed the effortless lifting of these enormous stone blocks and, and placing into place. Right. And um, uh, but I'm, I'm a bit surprised about Mithras because the tradition of Mithras was very popular among so soldiers and uh, and because it's depicted as subduing the bull etc. 
uh, people have uh, many people have interpreted it as an Arias quality. So you're talking about Mithras and being surprised. Well, that's a, that, that's a bit of a red herring, us I, I think right now. Okay. And I, I have not uh, looked at that in detail for a long time, so I can't really come from a place of being really totally informed. Yeah. But the point is, every age has their avatar. That's right. And every age is connected to a sub-race or a root race? Well, it depends what sort of age you're talking about. So give us the gist of the ages then. Well, we're just talking about the astrological precession cycles, and they amount to... Uh, 25,920 years hmm. uh, when it goes full circle. And this is called the great year, of course, in the ancient uh, tradition. Hmm. And that great year corresponds roughly to a branch race we've been told by Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine. Hmm. Um, so at the moment, we are actually at the beginning of a 25,000-year cycle of Aquarius on the greater wheel as well as, as Aquarius on the smaller wheel. And we've been told that this is a, a, a an era of great opportunity because it's only happened for the seventh time in the history of the fifth root race. Hmm. So, but a root race can go for millions of years, and in the older root races, the sub races went for millions of years, albeit overlapping each other and one sub race generating another. So, it depends what cycle you're talking about. Right. And there are many, many different cycles, and it's a, it can be quite complex. But to keep it simple, we have three major root races, which we can see have many other cycles within them. And the Hindu yugas are one of the major ways of measuring those cycles because they get up to very big figures like 300 and, yeah, 311 million years for a so-called Manvantara. 617 million years for a round, which is the sum total of two Manvantaras. And if you resolve, if you, I have a table in, in my article, I think, that you that you read in, in my books, and perhaps in that video as well. Yeah, you do. It shows how the precession cycle is the basis of the, of the, uh, of, of any of the yugas, the Maha Yuga and the Mahanvantaras and the, and so on, right up to the to the largest figures, you know, the, the age of Brahma. Yeah, and I, I suggest everyone who are a bit confused now about all this talk about uh, these cycles, just go to his um, charts, very surveying um, listing of them, and it's easier to understand them. And I guess we could say that <clears throat> not all the, the not all the the ages are are the same, right? But the time of the root races differ. Some have more, some have less. Yeah. There's a designated life for each incarnation, if you like, of a mm. root race, mm. just as there is for an individual with their four score and four 84 years for, a, for an incarnation, for instance. Right. And so there is a certain degree of consciousness evolution that is envisaged by the guides of the race for any particular branch race, sub race, or root race uh, that is, is to be achieved. And so it doesn't necessarily have to run those exact amount of years for it to have achieved uh, its goal. And quite often it doesn't, uh, as I demonstrate in my book. Mm. But each of these, these um, <clears throat> sub races and root, root races generate the next one. And so evolution is going forward all the time, no matter how many mistakes humanity makes there's there's a uh, there's a general forward moving of evolution mm. and so i demonstrate how this occurs since the time of ancient lemuria which is in esoteric chronology 21.6 million years ago when, uh, we'll get to lemuria but when you talk about the yugas uh, that's obviously the hindu terminology. I think actually it's easier for the listener if we were using the Greek terms, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. Yes. Because they, you've actually managed to put them, compare them, and yeah. find a harmony, right? Yeah, they, they correspond. You know, the Satya or Golden Age corresponds to the Greek Golden Age, the, the, uh, the Kali Yuga of the Hindu tradition, which everyone's probably heard about, is the Iron Age. Uh, in the Greek tradition and so forth. Yeah, so we do actually live in the Kali uh, Yuga now. 
we are living in the Kali Yuga of the fifth Oof. root race. Oof. Okay, because each <laughs> okay. root race has its has its yugas. But they say everything is dark and 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 you know it's the worst age if you read. Yes, it. Yes, it, it, <laughs> it is. It is, and it's getting worse. But we have an emerging uh, such a yuga or golden age coming forth now as part of the next root race, the sixth root race, which right. we're going to. See, we're not only on the cusp of these two race cycles that I mentioned before and the two zodiac cycles, but we are also on the cusp of the fifth root race and the sixth root race, which is a recapitulation of the period when the fourth root race, Atlantis, was moving into the fifth root race that we're in now, mm. four million years ago. So we are in extraordinary times right now, and we have the same choices uh, and decisions to make that we had back then, and and hence the the great conflict that's going on on this planet at the moment. Yeah, yeah, we, and we can get to that. And there's going to be also a lot of natural disasters and stuff, uh, birth, um, what you call it? Um, yeah, cataclysms, the birth of the new age. Birth, uh, spasms, something yes. like that, yeah. But uh, just for to, <clears throat> again, to dumb it down, so for those who are, who are new to this concept, the oldest it would be the golden age, than the Silver Age, which yeah, was... Uh, yeah, they are on a four three two zero ratio to one another. I see. So if you look at the Kali Yuga or the, or the Iron Age and multiply that by four, you get the figure of the, the Golden Age. So the, the Kali Yuga is 432,000 years, and um, you double that to make 864 years, 1,000 years, and you add another 432,000 onto that twice again and you get the golden age of one one point seven two eight million years yeah that's the duration uh, so the golden age would be three million eight hundred thousand years ago or three three million nine hundred approximately yeah. silver age would be <clears throat> using your list here now <clears throat> silver age would be two point one uh, million years ago Bronze Age would be 850 approximately, and right, the Iron Age started uh, 3,000 years ago approximately. 3102 BC. Yeah. yeah, to be specific, yeah. yeah as far as the, the analogy with the Greek Ages goes, I think a good analogy I make in my new book that's coming out where I examine Greek mythology in, in a lot of depth nice. is that the, the true Bronze Age where they talk about the Etruscans and all the rest of it in, around the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. they're talked about in the in the symbolism of recent history of the last few thousand years, which is ridiculous. They they actually have their roots right back at the beginning of the Bronze Age, in eight hundred and sixty thousand years ago at the second major Atlantean flooding. Right. And I detail these cataclysms as well in my book. Right. Um, and also, we should say that. <clears throat> We should also mention the civilizations connected here, because even though we are in the fifth root race now, obviously we started at the first and now we're at the fifth, I don't think we should count the, the first ones, because that's a very esoteric concept. I suggest that we say that the Lemurian a, a civilization was the first human. Yes, you can count different ways. You can count the first, second and third root races as being Lemurian the Atlantean and the current Aryan root race. Yeah. And I, I, I talk about this in my books as well. The first two and a half root races were etheric and only came into physical manifestation halfway through the third root race of Lemuria. And that's when individualization, they became actually human souls. That's humanity as we know it. Man, woman, uh, at some point they split. Yeah, too. well, actually humanity as we know it in terms of having souls before that, Human beings were simply members of the animal kingdom with instinctual right. consciousness. Right. At the great spiritual event of individualization in Lemuria, hmm. they became imbued with with uh, with higher selves or souls, and that's when consciousness evolution started to evolve from there on. Hmm. So, what we would recognize as a human being would start around Lemuria. Exactly. Now, is it true that... But actually, we wouldn't recognize them because they were vastly different to what we are today. We are far more refined in our physical forms today. And also, of course, they were gigantic creatures back in those days. Okay, so they were the giants. They were huge, and they only had one eye on the top of the head, if you can imagine that. Cyclops. Well, yeah, and a lot of the cyclops are usually uh, in art are depicted with the eye and the forehead, which is probably inaccurate. 
two-eyed sight, we were told, only started to, to grow, uh, to evolve in human beings in early Atlantis. Oh, okay. The Lemurian giants were the one-eyed cyclops. And so, so even though they split into genders, they still only had one eye? That's right. And it's important to understand that, that hermaphrodite, humanity were hermaphrodite before the, the, um, the sexual separation. Yeah, Blavatsky argues that you can see it in the development of the fetus. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, I, I just said uh, that Blavatsky argued that you could see it in the development of the fetus. Yeah. The, you could see the evolution of mankind in exactly. the fetus. Yes, you can. And the study of embryology would yield a lot of uh, information for anyone who was so, so inclined to trace that evolution. Mm. Yes. Would would this eye that they had, would that be uh, a function of the third eye or the pineal gland? Well, the third eye is technically to do with the pituitary gland, but uh, the mm. y yes, it would. And and that, that eye at the back, towards the back of the head, we're told, just from the crown towards the back, was an all-seeing physical eye and spiritual eye. And that eventually receded back into the brain over a few million years. And that is something that we can see in in newborn babies, where the um, there is the the fontanelle hasn't closed over of the skull, and the the actual pineal gland at the centre of the brain is the remnant of that eye, of that of that first eye, as opposed to the third eye, you could say. Hmm. I've understood it as that the origin to the what we superficially refer to black people i mean everybody is mixed today but their origin to that was from the lemurian whereas the yeah. origin to the quote unquote yellow eastern asian was atlantis but yeah. that's too superficial then it is because as i point out particularly in my new book there are black yellow red and white races through lemuria atlantis and this fifth root race the iron root race at different times so there's always been all these colors around in all root races. There has, and, and maybe even there were some blue races as well. <laughs> yeah, I've heard about that too. By the way, nothing to do with the blue avians of Corey Good, if any <laughs> listener have heard about that. That's just well, fantasy, but yeah. Who knows? But um, So it is vastly more complex. And uh, you know, in my, in my YouTube commentaries, the amount of comments underneath the video are just, you know, they're just so much ignorance and a lot of people there are taking offense. <laughs> right. Plus, don't uh, forget the 30,000 hired trolls that CIA has on their payroll. Yes, that's what I so, thought. So, <laughs> you know, but uh, YouTube commenters, it's it's just a never-ending black hole of trolls. Yeah. All right. Anyway, one of the main commentaries I see is comments particularly by African-Americans. Mm -hmm that it's just a white supremacist bullshit video. Oh, typical. Uh, which is far from it. I think I think there's a, there's a certain degree of uh, defensiveness about that whole thing in America at the moment. So anything mm. that, that points towards, uh, well, the fact that there wasn't mentioned much in the video, that the blacks weren't mentioned. But I mentioned that much more in my book, not so much in the video. So but is mentioned in the book, those people will be able to find out for themselves to get a, a, a broader perspective. Yeah. Uh, there's certainly no, there's no bias. I'm actually going to write a paper and post it to both the video channels that my, um, my video is on at the moment for people to read uh, if, they, if they care to, to look at that about the, the whole question of the origin of the blacks and so forth. Yeah, but, you know, you live in Scandinavia. You know that we're very racially correct, if you can use that expression. Yeah. So, of course, there's a sensitivity. And in America today, when primitive forces are trying to put people up against each other based on the most superficial stuff, like left-right, for instance, and also, obviously, uh, religious and ethnic, everything to keep us fighting, divide and conquer, right? So I have to jump in here uh, and say that I understand why many people are, are very sensitive to this. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, yeah. But I want to defend it very easily. Uh, of course, go and read uh, Philip's account, but very easy, because this isn't a new problem. The Nazis, they took the esoteric lore, and they twisted it. That's right. And, and they wouldn't have done it if they could use it as it was as a racist thing. And they wouldn't feel the need to 
temper with it then. That's right. Which they did. Uh, and uh, in fact, they were so impressed by everybody was was a hundred years ago uh, or more uh, reading these things and so impressed. But then they had their own agendas. And it's in esoteric. If you take the tradition, the pure tradition and twist it, yeah. that's defined as a black uh, no, nothing to do with race now, uh, more as in black magic, as a, as a negative exactly. thing. But l let me quickly defend it by saying that according to this system, the new race is going to be, the, the sixth race, I guess, is going to be the merging of all existing races. And that's Hitler's exactly. worst nightmare. <laughs> exactly. And, so, you know, the, the, the Nazis took the, the word Aryan, they hijacked the word Aryan yeah. and made it their own. So even today, when you say the word Aryan, it has this Nazi connotation, yeah. which is far from the truth. It, it has this Hindu, ancient Hindu association. It's the same with the swastika. And of course, yeah, because they even call them Aryan white supremacists in the States now, of course. Yeah. And they, they, they hijacked the swastika as well and reversed it, which meant the, the complete reversal of spirit and the, and the worship of matter. Matter over, over mind, so yes. So there was certainly a, a black magical process par excellence, of which, of course, Himmler was deeply involved in. You know, so they, they did try and hijack the esoteric doctrine. And that was part of their whole uh, game. But yeah. ultimately, it didn't work. The forces of light uh, won out, but we still have not... Um, solve the problem yet since since uh, World War Two. No, and, and another very important defense of this system is that mm -hmm. uh, the whole point with this system is that reincarnation uh, is a, a lifetime is like a day in your life sure. in the esoteric lore. That means that you'll have many days, you'll wake up, and that means also you'll incarnate a lot. And uh, as you make a point out of, we are talking about the forms, whereas the consciousness is moving through these forms, these vehicle, these shapes. And that means that you, your consciousness may at one point have been in a blue <laughs> person, in a, at another point in a red, etc. So it's not like some souls are incarnating only in one race, right? Exactly. To round out the soul experience, we have to incarnate in all races, east mm. and west, male and female, many different uh, situations and, and, and cultural conditions uh, that, that uh, shape our consciousness and help us evolve that consciousness over millions of years. And, and this is my whole point. The Hidden History of Humanity or the Unveiling unveiling Genesis books and videos and so forth are really about the history of human consciousness, the history of the human soul. Mm. Many people don't even know that they're souls <laughs> yet and that um, you know they, they go willfully on their personality way without ne necessarily any, any um, connection to the higher self. Mm. So it's, it's about that. And as you say, with the Sixth Root Race, we are going into a unique period now that has never occurred on this planet before. We are going into a, a synthesis of all races, of which the United States, of course, and, and a large part of Europe is the beginning. You know, we, we have in Australia and in Europe and many other countries over 200 ethnic minorities. Yeah, melting pots, yeah. Which is extraordinary. Mm. And we have these, these short-term conflicts which are going on with uh, a lot of Middle Eastern third sub-race people here. This is the first time this has ever happened in the history of the planet. Of course, there's going to be conflict. But if we look to the longer term cycles, there will be uh, ultimately a resolution of the conflict and a synthesis of the races in, in several generations time. So a new race will emerge and I've heard that will happen in, in Brazil. It will happen. You know, Brazil has been designated as the area of the first sub-race of the sixth root race, mm. which will emerge proper in about 25,000 years time, which seems like a long time, but it actually corresponds to the entire greater wheel of Aquarius. And in fact, also Brazil is the, is the, uh, the middle of South America, which is Brazil is where the first Lemurian root race or one of the first pockets, if you like, of the Lemurian races, was born. Wow. And that's where the original Shambhala uh, was located in that area. That's new because um, mm. traditionally people regard the Lemurian continent as being in the Pacific and Atlantean in the Atlantic. That's right. 
I just have to also point out a very important uh, caveat, and that's that, and, and I think you touch it too, people are looking for Atlantis as if it's a city. They don't realize we're talking about a civilization. Exactly. Meaning Atlantis, there were many Atlantis yes. places, right? Yeah, this is an important point, I, I, um, and I bring this out in my writings uh, regularly, mm -hmm. because there are... It's the most written about subject in the history of the world, I think, is technically speaking, there's been more books written about Atlantis yeah. than anything else. And and so the and the title of most books is, oh, you know, such and such has finally found the lost Atlantis, uh, you know, in Indonesia, in the Atlantic, in South America. But they are all aspects of the old Atlantean civilization, which is around the whole planet. Mm. However, the primary area, as in Atlantic, was uh, in the Atlantic Ocean and a large part of, of North America and South America was the old Atlantis. Um, and with Lemuria, those, that continent spanned the entire Pacific, as shown in James Churchwood's diagrams and so forth. Uh, but it only shows it in the Pacific. But However, that Lemurian continent went from the Americas, both south and north, right across the Pacific, across Indonesia, up to the foothills of the Himalayas, and right across to Madagascar in the west, mm. and down to Australia and, and New Zealand and Tasmania. So, so that's um, why you find weird animals in Madagascar and Australia that's been... Yes. Because they are older, so they've been isolated. And this is where the science comes in, because we can find the flora and fauna similarities or, or almost identical in some cases between uh, Africa and South America, between Australia and South America and so on, then you have you have many keys to, to this ancient history. There's a language key. There's an artifact key. Right. There's, there are flora and fauna keys. There's a geological key. And I cover a lot of these keys, some in more depth than others, in, the, in, in my books. And that will eventually... Um, yeah, I think I think we need to credit you also with a very important fact that it's not just that you're presenting uh, a hypothesis here. You actually found uh, scientific corroboration that backs up much of this stuff. And, and in fact, ever since Blavatsky published The Secret Doctrine, which was the first exoteric exponential to this stuff, Although it's been slaughtered by mainstream materialistic science, all scientific development has pointed, never debunked, always supported, supported, supported new findings. Of course, not conscious, not that they want to. I mean, they do it begrudgingly. Let's just take a simple fact that Blavatsky claimed that Neanderthals weren't another species. Back then, she was laughed at. They regarded Neanderthals as apes, basically. Yeah. Now we know that Neanderthals obviously was humans and that we interbreeded with them and that they were just a local variation, I guess you could say. And <clears throat> so there is a lot of scientific... And, and you know, of course, Michael Cremer's work. Yes, I love Michael Cremer's work. I listened to the interview we uh, with you and him, no. actually, yes. Now, he... Uh, is also using the scientific approach. And if you take his findings, then everything you're presenting is plausible. Indeed. In fact, Michael Michael's work is the closest to mine because he draws upon the Hindu tradition himself. He's a Vedantist. And um, and so the, the all the Hindu teachings that he draws upon. And when you mentioned before how I have found these scientific proofs, some of the proofs have come from a lot of the, the what I call New Age archaeologists hmm. who aren't necessarily esoterically inclined, but they've done fantastic work in their own areas. So they haven't strayed so much out of the 6,000 years or 10,000 years of history paradigm, but they've done some, some excellent work within that paradigm with the, the various artifacts and ruins, the mines, the Egyptians and so forth. Um, and my main argument with, with most of them has been just go back a lot more procession cycles than where you are right now mm. and uh, into the greater yugas and you'll find where they, those civilizations actually began and where they, where they properly sit. So, yes, it's um, uh, the thing about Neanderthals too, you know, 
one of the major things that Blavatsky brought out, the secret doctrine, was the fact that humans did not come from apes. Apes came from humans. Yeah, I, I have that in my notes to ask you about that mystery. Should we take it now? Yeah, like when, when humanity were newly individualized back in Lemurian times, mm -hmm. they were a fledgling, young, large, clumsy humanity, <laughs> still, you know, coordinating their etheric bodies with their physical bodies, mm. um, being guided by the, the so-called guides of the race, which is a whole other story in itself, mm. um, being taught things like agriculture, building, fishing, you know, uh, all the basics to, to get kick-started, uh, as it were. But the, the consciousness was very low, and they were just recently emerged from the animal kingdom. And so, but also another happening, and another thing happened at the, at the same time, which has been called the sin of the mindless. mindless. And um, that was that the particular souls, if you like, that were ordered, quote unquote, to incarnate at that time, a third of them chose not to. Hmm. And so they left these, they, they said the, the, the tabernacles or the bodies were too coarse to, to, to lower themselves, if you like, into. And they refused the, the, this, this command, this divine command, if you like. And as a result, these, the, a, a large proportion of humanity were destitute of consciousness of, of being infused with soul. And so they were still animals. They only had animal instinctual consciousness, so they bred with animals. They bred with monsters, uh, or they created monsters from this interbreeding, of which the apparently the anthropoid apes and so forth are the are the uh, latest descendants. So Rudolf Steiner and Madame Lovatsky's allegation that modern apes are not ancestors to humans, but the opposite, they are degenerated humans, kind of. No, they're, they're animals. They're not even degenerated humans. Although there was a great mystery around one or two of the apes, like the orangutan particularly. Mm. That's a whole other story too. But I'm not sure what you said about Rudolf Steiner. I know him and Blavatsky had a bit of conflict between them. Are you saying that he, he debunked what Blavatsky said or he agreed with her? No, I, I, on some points there were, you know, he, he started out as a theosophist, right? Yes, yes, that's right. But he just felt it was too Eastern oriented. Yes, yes that's right. Um, oh, yeah. But he, no, he, I mean, he corroborated much yeah, of... Okay. I, I wasn't sure what he had. I've, I've read a lot of the Steiner books yeah. uh, way back. but Very vague. He had certain views that I never, and also his his uh, views on time cycles were, for me, didn't work. Mm. So I've always stuck with the benchmark of Blavatsky's uh, Secret Doctrine, Isis Unveiled, and, and all her other works. Which she didn't invent out of thin air, but I'll, I'll get back to that. Now, so we've debunked the racist aspect. And I, oh, one last thing about the racist twisting of this uh, lore. You know, like I said to you before we begun, if, if you are inclined to identify with something so superficial as ethnicity or whatever, right, then oh. you'll try to find something backing up that view no matter what. So if the quote-unquote white genes were the oldest, then they would say, oh, oh, all the others are invaders on Earth and we should <laughs> eradicate them and go back to the region. And they would say that <laughs> the Earth belongs to us. But uh, as soon as uh, it's the black that's the oldest, then they say, yeah. oh, 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 we are the refined, they are the old uh, yeah. primitive ones and we are the new improvements. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like you say, it's, it's about consciousness, not about genes. Yes, and you know, there's been some very interesting uh, advances lately with DNA, and they've had a few TV shows, which you've probably seen, where they get people who are racist on the show, who have already had a DNA test, and they, they find out that they've got... They've got a whole bunch of DNA, which is of the people they're criticizing. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, but of course, it's easy to deal with that because then the whole gene technology is a conspiracy. <laughs> well, it, it, it may or may not be, but that's but, what they uh, say. The point, the point being that uh, it it uh, was very humbling for a lot of people to be faced by that people who are yeah. who are shockingly uh, bigoted racists who found out that their roots were actually as much as the person that they were biased against. But, uh, um, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't support conflict, suppression, warfare, etc., because it keeps us down. But if you were to be annoyed with a type of human beings, at least be biased on the consciousness level. Okay. <laughs> at least try to attack those who make the world worse. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> Couldn't they be spiritual racist instead? <laughs> yeah. And I don't mean a, a religious war. I mean, like, what kind of vibe are you manifesting on Earth? But let's that be... You, you were already getting on to more interesting areas uh, like Lemuria and Atlantis. Now, mm. we've cleared up that they are civilizations uh, over vast areas of time and vast geographies and the Lemurian is the oldest, right? Yes. And the Atlantean is younger. And you also support, although you said that the Lemurian, uh, you said that Shambhala actually started in South America. That's interesting. That was the first outpost. It was called the um, the uh, Temple of Ibez, I-B-E-Z. Right, and but still, uh, you back that the main Lemurian continent was in the Pacific. Uh, no, no, actually, from Sri Lanka to Australia to Madagascar. No, actually not. No, not really. I mean, the the one of the largest land masses part of the Lemurian continent was in the Pacific. But yeah, as I discuss in my book, the actual beginning of Lemuria started around where you live in Norway. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, it, it, it was actually a prolongation of the, of the polar ice cap or the polar, uh, the polar lands, I should say. Um, mm -hmm. It was an extension of what they used to call Hyperborea, which was the second root race, right. the first root race being the Polarian. And so the third root race was a prolongation that came down into the northern Atlantic and covered parts of Scandinavia and Britain. Mm. And from that part actually was the was the beginning of a, of the first Atlantean continents apparently, but that Lemurian back in that you know my, my next book is going to be called Geography and Giants where I trace the the Great. the transformation of the continents and their their change over millions of years. So the Lemurian, the extension from the through the Atlantic went down around what we now call Africa, but that Africa wasn't there before. Only part of the northern part of Africa was there. Mm. Uh, around through Madagascar, because Madagascar was part of that original Lemuria, mm. um, across the Indian Ocean to Australia, and then across the Pacific Ocean. So the actual origin, Blavatsky does say, was was in the northern regions, and there were many proofs, geological and otherwise, for that. Yeah, yeah, because we live on uh, Norway. Maybe whole of Scandinavia is actually on the what's called the Caledonian mountain range, exactly. which is one of the oldest yes. on Earth. So, so that could make sense. Yes, Scotland, parts of Scotland, yep. and and so forth. Which is why it's called the Caledonian, because that's the I, I believe that's the word for Scotland in. Ah, okay. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. The, uh, but at one stage, the largest landmass was across the Pacific Ocean extended. You know, Australia is the largest su surviving remnant of that landmass. And you have hundreds or thousands of islands scattered across the Pacific, which are all parts of that old Lemurian continent. Mm. So particularly Easter Island, for instance, is part of that old Lemurian continent. Mm. Uh, Hawaii, um, various... Uh, Various islands throughout the Pacific have these ancient artifacts, statues, buildings, uh, monoliths. Yeah, yeah, on Eastern Island, it's obvious. They're that... all Lemurian, but, but uh, not just to Ireland, but many other places. People like David Hatcher Childress have done wonderful work yeah. in going through all those places and exploring them and taking pictures and putting them into books and so forth. Yeah, we're going to interview him. But uh, we, we did talk with Robert Schock, and he's very uh, interested in the Eastern Island, and he argues that they, they, these giant statues are very, very old. So that's corroborating your stuff too, if you say that mm. that goes back to the giants, the Lemurians. Yes, well, I, I'm glad Robert Schock does say that because, I mean, he's a bit of a skeptic on some things. Um, oh, but, sure. Uh, <laughs> he's, a, he's a hardcore geologist, geologist, scientist, yeah, he has to stick to, to the, the mainstream paradigm as much as possible, you know. Well, he doesn't have to, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he wants to keep his work, I guess. The statues in Easter Island, Blavatsky says, yeah. um, when Captain Cook discovered, quote-unquote, 
those statues were, were 10 metres or 30 feet in height. And she says that they were the actual height of the giants that existed on that island about 4 million years ago. And um, Only 4 million? Yeah. You, you know, I thought the giants were living at the same time as the dinosaurs because everything was bigger then. They were. They were, and there's been proof of that, of course, in the Peruvian eco stones, uh, the carvings where it shows human beings um, battling with dinosaurs. But, you know, the whole extinction of the dinosaurs paradigm of 65 million years ago, I think, is incorrect. Yeah. And it's more like 21 million years ago, around about the time of individualization of humanity. Right. And I say this because we are told in the ancient teachings that there was a huge electrical storm that was created in individualization. This was the, the literally the spark of mind or manas was being imparted to humanity at that time, and it destroyed most of the animal kingdom. And that was the, the true death of the dinosaurs. And it didn't come about through any particular cometary crash into the planet. It was more to do with this electrical storm. Right. Um, and if we think more in terms of electricity, which we will be doing so increasingly as we go into the Aquarian age, then perhaps more understanding will come about that. So that, that electrical storm created a situation um, where the, the souls the, that were waiting, that were given the command, if you like, to incarnate, were able to do so, but they were able to appropriate bodies, but um, come into, into being with far more refined bodies. Right. And from that time onwards, the refinement in the physical vehicle became more and more so as the consciousness developed, which only stands to reason, doesn't it? Indeed. The more refined the consciousness, the more refined the body, the less large it has to be. And Blavatsky says, though, even halfway through Atlantis, the uh, giants had reached their uh, an acme of physical development, of beauty, and had all the secrets of heaven and earth uh, within them. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, there were various stages where basically the the uh, diminution of the heights of the giants paralleled that of the reptile kingdom. So there were probably still dinosaurs around for a long time after the Yeah, remnants, right? Yes. Uh, we call them dragons in mythology. That, and but even all the other species probably weren't killed out entirely, so they were around for several million years, I would imagine. Even stories up into recent times, you know, as you say, of dragons and so forth. So, And, and what about Loch Ness? And, and we even have a Loch yeah, Ness exactly. monster here in Norway. I don't know if you know, it's <laughs> in Sjælio. It's a water. Okay. So there's so, observations of these uh, kind of... I mean, it reminds us of um, aqua dinosaurs, you know. And exactly. And, you know, there were, this parallel, however, of humanity and the reptiles is, I think, holds well all the way through to present day. So we have our alligators and our Komodo dragons yeah. and so forth. And uh, we have our humans who um, are still quite tall. We, st we still have giants on the planet. Yeah. Uh, people who are nine feet tall and... And there are many stories in the last few thousand years from Greek, Roman yes. mythology and, and universal mythology, really, that talk about various giants that were... Oh, you know, God, it must have been terrible to be a giant <laughs> in the age of the small man. Well, you know, we, we were all giants. But, however, we are told by Vlavaski as well that there were parallel races of dwarfs as well. Right. So we had... We had opposite, and this is going right back to Lemuria, I think. And the other thing that I've discussed with some people in the in the New Age archaeological community is that I don't think anyone seems to understand that there were always primitive races around while there were yeah. advanced races. But the general consensus at the moment still seems to be, which correlates to to the to the establishment of anthropology and archaeology is that uh, there were only you know very degenerate and and unevolved races around 
mm. in olden times and they suddenly came fully fledged a few thousand years ago <laughs> into advanced civilizations like Egypt and, and India and so forth. This is ridiculous. It's incredible. You know, it's, uh, so, just like today, there's still uh, people who live, uh, yeah. you know, natives who live uh, simple lives, you know. Uh, sure. I don't like the word primitive because it's got yeah. a wrong uh, meaning. Primitive isn't necessarily negative, but they live like you know, like yeah. with nature. And there's the, those who are so alienated from nature uh, that they never encounter it anymore. They yeah. only rely on technology. And uh, yeah. now that we know there was ancient technology, obviously uh, it was the same thing. This is a very good point. It's a very good point, Al, because what I want to say here is that, for instance. The Australian Aborigines, the Papuans, the Vedas of Sri Lanka and the African Bushmen are regarded as the oldest remnants of the Lemurian uh, race. Mm. And so you have, as you say, some of the, those, those individuals living the traditional ways and ho are still uh, expressing the culture. But, you know, in Australia, for instance, which is my home country, we have... Uh, Aborigines who have integrated into the into the uh, invading white races, if you like, who you know that integration didn't happen well at all. Mm. But nevertheless, that's because we sent down bandits, you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's happened in every country, of course. You know, yeah. you know, all the colonial colonialists and so forth. But the, the point I'm making here is that these Aborigines who have integrated uh, have uh, many of them have fifth root race consciousness. Mm. And we come back again to the, the thing between ethnicity and consciousness. And paradoxically or uh, alternatively, in India, which is the seat of the fifth root race, many souls there uh, are very young and have Atlantean consciousness, but they are in fifth root race bodies. Mm. Likewise, in Asia, which are regarded as, you know, most Asian bodies are regarded as, as uh, Atlantean bodies, the consciousness is, is of the fifth root race particularly in places like Japan, for instance. Mm. Um, now, that's why they're so technologically minded. Yeah, there's, there's certain rays and astrological forces that, that, that rule Japan. One of them is, is Capricorn, for instance, which is, right. gives them that, that extensive manufacturing capability. But it's also their culture, which has shaped them. You know, mm. they've, they've shaped all that. You know, the, the Zen, the, the very refined arts... There are so many in Japan. It's, it's a great example of. Um, but, but hang on, how could how could Bushman, for instance, uh, be a remnant of Lemuria if Lemuria were giants and Bushmen are the opposite? Well, well, the Australians aren't giant, the Aborigines aren't giants either. They've, no, they, their size has has decreased to, uh, in parallel with with all the rest of us. Right, right, right. That is periods of time, so that they don't have to be uh, giants, but they. It shows also the distribution. These races, these ancient races, are remnants of and showing the distribution of where the continent of Lemuria covered. For instance, it was near Africa um, and, and part of, of, of Africa at one point, especially the Madagascan Mauritius area, but not so much the other part of the continent of Africa, which came up at different times after Lemuria. Mm. We've been told by the Alaska anyway. So in my next book on, called Geography and Giants, I hope to map this out to show the transformation of these continents and, and island continents and the habitations of the various races and giants associated with them. I still say it must have been bad being a giant in the area of small <laughs> small men. I mean, you could could they even breed with us? Wouldn't they be too big? Um, I'm not sure with you. Uh, the the thing I'm uh, I'm not sure whether you really understand the the way I see this, Al, mm. is that we're all giants, and there are mainly gigantic civilizations. Period in the past. Yeah, but weren't there uh, you know an overlapping time? There was, when... there was, and and as in the Bible it says, the the sons of men saw the daughters uh, as as being fair and all that kind of stuff. There was yeah. mating of um, of much larger species with much smaller species. And this, these, these stories um, extend in, in many traditions. For instance, the Easter Island giants, the Lemurian giants on Easter Island were eventually kicked off 
by the degenerated giants from Atlantis because the Atlantis and Lemuria overlapped each other, of course. Hmm. And those particular giants from um, Atlantis uh, left Easter Island and went to the mainland. And there's a story that's brilliantly covered by an anthropologist of a tribe in, in South America that I think it might be Ecuador that has this story of how the giants came to the, to, to the village mm-hmm. and, um, and basically ate up the inhabitants over a period of years before they could finally... Literally ate them? Yes. So they were cannibals. Yes, they were cannibals. And the villagers eventually dug these pits to trap them and, and kill them over a period of years, but not before these giants had also bred with some of the women. Right. And uh, these giants had six toes and six fingers, which is a common uh, story that you hear in all the, the giant yeah. stories around the world. And this tribe to this day has uh, six fingers, six toes. Many of the people in those tribes wow. have six fingers, six toes. Plus, they are the most violent tribe probably in the world. The, the murder rate and the violence is extraordinary, apparently. Um, and it's it's like a like a hand down uh, from the uh, from these violent giants. They are incredibly violent, apparently. Huh. So we have the good giants and the bad giants of of mythology. There's truth in that. Um, yeah. Atlantis was destroyed because the civilization had abused its um, god given powers. It had abused um, magic, sex. The incidence of theft was one of the one of the greatest crimes apparently on Atlantis, right. and so it was finally brought to an end, quite dramatically, with the first Atlantean flood, the first of four floods, which occurred over a period of almost four million years. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the flood. So, so according to this law, there's not just one flood, uh, but several global floods. Yeah, yeah, and so this is another thing in exoteric anthropology or new age archaeology um they talk about one flood uh and and there were several and that's why it's so hard to you know to 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 discriminate between the floods and the civilizations of what who came first with all the ruins built on top of each other you know some cities have six cities below them that were built Mm -hmm. at various times so the first flood came about at the time of the the original story of the mahabharata Mm. of which the Bhagavad Gavita is the golden kernel of Krishna on the battlefield with his disciple Arjuna. And this was a, a, uh, a family fight, if you like, between the, between, it was a family squabble in the deepest sense of the term, of old Atlantis, which was, which in, which was on part of the Indian continent of what we call India today anyway. Mm. And so... So most people think that was fought out, you know, three thousand BC. It, it was <laughs> that was the Kali Yuga, beginning of the Kali Yuga for the fifth root race. The Atlantean conflict was fought out in the Kali Yuga of the Atlantean root race, which was starting. So everyone has their Kali Yuga. Everyone has their decay era. Yeah. So mm. it was unfolding at the same time as the Golden Age was starting for the fifth root race back that that time. Mm. So not long after that war, which apparently the forces of materialism gained the upper hand, um, the, um, the great flood occurred on the planet. And this is the one, of course, that we hear about with uh, the story of Noah and the ark. So, so and hang on. How many years ago are we talking about now? We're talking the first flood around, almost four million years ago. Would this be the war between Lemuria and Atlantis? No, there were many, many wars between the overlapping sub-races of Lemuria and the Atlanteans much, much earlier than that. Okay. Mm. They were you know, going back, say, 15 million years ago when uh, uh, Lemuria and Atlantis were in full full flight. So they were different races. They cohabited with one another. They fought one another. They interbred with one another. But this was over an extraordinarily long period of time. Yeah, and you make a point of, uh, it's, I think it's important to add this, that you make a point of that at the end of every age, there will be some sort of global cataclysm, either yeah. by fire, by water, mm-hmm. That's right. Ed. even winds, storms, so Lemuria and sub- earthquakes. 
Exactly. Lemuria sunk, but it was actually volcanic fire that destroyed it. Uh, Atlantis was destroyed by water from constant deluge of rain that, that covered the entire planet uh, so that the only survivors were found on the mountaintops. And the this fifth root race will be destroyed by fire again, like in Lemuria, through volcanic and earthquake activity. Oh, do we have to? Why couldn't we get water? I would rather <laughs> go under by water. <laughs> But then, I, again, my sun sign is Pisces, maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but these cataclysms will increase, apparently, in the next few thousand years yeah. as we head to the age of um, to the Sixth Root Race period. But, but the last remnant of Atlantis uh, 12,000 years ago, which is the classical Atlantis, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when the Ice Age ended uh, abruptly then, mm -hmm. obviously there was a flood uh, just by that very fact. Exactly. And also the second flood was the result of the melting of, of uh, an Ice Age, apparently, 860,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, so these are, these are very complex notions. Again... Um, you should check his uh, books, his charts, his survey lists to not be confused about all these things. Yeah, with the scientific evidence, I'm I'm not by any means, you know, super in depth, but I do give a fair bit of depth as much as I can yeah. in bridging those sciences to esoteric science. For instance, I do mention the cycles of the ice ages that have been mentioned by various um, scientists. And um, and the correlations, I think even Lovasky might mention one actually, the correlations with those sinkings. But the yeah. last one was Poseidonus. The fourth and final sinking was Poseidonus, which was part of a of the um, of one of the last Atlantean uh, island continents, and that went down overnight. Literally, and and still there are traditions around, especially mystery schools, that has inherited remnants of their arts, their knowledge, even the language. There's still words around, and even code systems. Absolutely, but they, that comes from Poseidon, as you call it, the lost island, well, of the lost end of the Atlantis. Yes and no. I mean, the all that ancient knowledge has come down to us through various streams. And, for instance, the hierarchy or the, the Great White Brotherhood today who, who help and guide humanity and the planet, um, their astronomical calculations are based upon an ancient uh, Atlantean sorcerer called Asura Maya, uh, who was around about 2.16 million years ago. Wow. And um, it, this Asura Maya has a lot to do with the Mayans, actually, because the Mayans and the Egyptians although they are sub-races of the fifth root race, had their original genus back in Atlantis. Mm. So, um, yeah, the, the information has come down to us from many streams, but essentially what Blavatsky was, was she was an amanuensis for this great white brotherhood who transmitted these teachings to her. Um, and that is one of the ways that we have, have regained this ancient lost knowledge. Right. And we've invoked it. You know, humanity in its cry for light has really invoked this this knowledge in the last 500 years. And mm. the the guide the guides of the race have been obliged by karmic and universal law to respond and evoke, give an evocation of what has been invoked. Right. Mm. Hey, mm, time flies when we're having fun. I suggest we take a short break right now. Okay. And when we come back, I'll throw at you a lot of notes from what we already talked about. Yeah, sure. Okay. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show... You can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Welcome back to part two of this uh, esoteric take on the uh, ancient history of the human race. And we join today with Philip Lindsay, expert in these matters, as well as esoteric astrology, which, by the way, is much more than 
just what people associate to astrology. It's a huge... I guess that's why you decoded the timeline, Philip, because you've been studying... Um, these cycle systems so deeply yeah i guess it's the it's um astrology is it is itself a science of cycles and i eventually branched out into the into a deeper study of the cycles through the history if you take the subject of astrology history and cycles they are all what we call upon the third ray line which is the third ray of active intelligence it rules cycles astrology and uh, mathematics uh, mm. and so forth. So, you know, we can pretty much classify everything according to the rays or astrology. Everything has an astrological quality that it's ruled by, whether it's a flower, a continent, a human being, or a planet, or a root race. You know? Yeah, you make that very clear in your movie. That's one of the things that people manage to understand from yeah. the movie. Now, um, we mentioned that there's various causes or sources to to these timelines that's floating around that survived but could you just give us an explanation for why the conservative the the, the mainstream is so conservative when it comes to approaching huh. time yes it's well it's kind of ironic because a lot of them who regard themselves as scientific and having a scientific method are actually not scientific in other words they tend to be uh, victims of their of religious conditioning. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, Egyptology and archaeology are—I won't even call them ideolo ideology. They are mere religions. They are fanatical religions. They, Just have to say that they can be the. Um, and so, for a lot of scientists, there is belief rather than actual knowing that enters into the equation. So they are ignoring facts when it comes to accounting for timelines. Yeah, no, uh, the, the question was the original, um, why they won't stray outside of the time frame. Yeah. Well, I, I think there are, there are several reasons, and I outline this in my essay on, on my website at esotericastrologer.org, where I talk about the various reasons for staying confined to those, those timelines. There's about six reasons that I give, uh, a couple of which... I think you give eight, actually. Yeah, have to, have to do with the uh, wanting to to contain a, a, um, a dumbed-down version of history to control people. Mm. Um, another one is, is the fact that the exoteric sciences only deal with what can be measured, mm. what can be seen, as opposed to, to the esoteric sciences which deal with the science of the unseen. And, and I have to add that it's so ironic that in the majority of mankind's existence, uh, the oral traditions were, were emphasized, not the written. And so when science comes and tries to take on these things, obviously they ignore yeah. the or even the written oral, which we could call mythology and, and yeah. systems. And even now, you know, um, academia has become such a such a business. Uh, that, you know, ac academics maintain certain viewpoints in order to get their grants. Mm. And uh, and I give one example of that with that uh, female archaeologist that uh, uh, McIntyre, I think her name is, who was drummed out of academia because of her claims of, of much older chronology in a place in Mexico that uh, upset the status quo. But even New Age archaeologists, unfortunately, do not stray further out of that area. People like Graham Hancock, who has done some marvellous work, of course, everyone knows of, um, have not ventured too far beyond that paradigm either, although that is starting to come back a bit earlier, I notice, in his more recent writings. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah can I just say that because their, their problem... They they had to take the fight. They were in the middle of the battlefield back in the day, yeah. and when they started to John Anthony West and the Sphinx and all this yes, stuff. Yes. But but now the reason they're coming back with a vengeance now, and the reason they are, I guess, also going further back in 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 timing, is that because now they can without being chopped down because of Göbekli Tepe, right? Yes. yes. That allows Göbekli Tepe opens the door now. Yes. For so much. Yes. And, and it's and they're still they are uh, these new age archaeologists if you like are, are, are a bridge to academia, and so they challenge academia, 
and they work with the same sort of framework as academia does, but they they do a lot of the pioneering work for academia in, in, in a lot of ways too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but because they're not actually esotericists, and I don't mean to, to sound condescending by saying that, because they don't necessarily have the esoteric training. Actually, some of them, I won't mention names, but some of them actually do. Yes, some of them do. Some yeah. of them do, but mm. a lot of them regard uh, or rebut Blavatsky, for instance, as a, as a quack. Oh, right. So that stops them from from embracing the possibility of these these longer time cycles. And that's why they won't venture outside maybe 25,000 years at the most for a lot of these practitioners. But a few of them I've heard on the grapevine recently are starting to entertain far greater time cycles than they than they have done in their in their earlier work, uh, which is very encouraging. Because, you know, when you think about it, you know, we, yep. we do need this extraordinarily long evolution to have evolved to where we are today. We, it, right. it, it can't happen in 4,000 years or 20,000 years. <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> no, that's impossible. I know some of them at a personal basis are into the esoteric, but outwards they have to maintain the... Okay. You, you know, just to keep credibility. Yeah. Now, I have to say to defend Blavatsky too, many people think she's just someone who dictated a lot of th speculation. But if you read, for instance, I think it's part four of The Secret Doctrine. Um, when I say part four, I mean in the Scandinavian edition. I guess it's That's just... Probably probably book two anthropogenic book two yeah. yeah it's so enjoyable to read she goes mm, through mm. she goes straight into the materialistic science and yeah. you know you know how to discuss with the Jehovah's witnesses right you can't <laughs> use reason you the only way you can discuss with them and convince them yeah. is to go in and discuss the bible at their own terms and use their own language yeah and argue from a Bible thumping point of view. If you do that, you can actually convert them. Now, that's what Blavatsky does with, with the materialist scientists. She goes okay. in and she discusses, uh, she gives scientific observations, scientific arguments, scientific yeah. uh, references all through that part. I can give you a quote here, just talking about that. Sure. Because you reminded me of a passage in the first chapter of my book yeah. um, where I'm talking about Blavatsky. Uh, here's the quote. Many authors prolifically refer to the secret doctrine. H.P.B. Blavatsky was an agent of destruction for the old culture. She came to dismantle it and to act as a catalyst for the new culture. She challenged doctrines that were the cradle of the old culture, whilst her great intellectual acumen took on the finest minds of the time in the realm of science and religion. She understood thesis, antithesis, and synthesis and was able to give convincing rational argument in any debate, unquote. Mm. So, yes, you, you're right. And th this is another reason why I decided to rewrite this book and center it around Genesis, because it's something that the Western mind yeah. has been conditioned by, even though they may reject it, for, um, for centuries, mm. for thousands of years. And... And, and I'm looking at, at finding a new audience because there are many Christian thinkers who are, who are mystics at heart. And, and this kind of, that they were far more common at the end of, in Blavatsky's time, actually, in the 19th century. But there, there are plenty around today, and I'm hoping that that will elicit some interest. And also the fact from the point of view of, um, of uh, con uh, comparative religion we're looking at the fact that, that everything came from the Hindu tradition, the, the, the Mayan, the, the Egyptian, the Christian, the Judaic, especially... Hang on, hang on. I, I take issue with that. I'd, I'd say, instead of saying it comes from the Hindu, I'd say that the Hindu is the oldest remnant, but that they all have common older sources. Well, what, what I was going to say was that Judaism, for instance, has taken everything from, from straight from the Hindu, and I demonstrate this in my book, and I... I yeah. All right, in that case. Like Christianity has taken. Yeah. I compare, for instance, the, the Hindu Manus with the Judaic patriarchs. They are identical and the names are almost the same. Sure, yeah. And the ages of the patriarchs and so forth, you know, when, when uh, Adam begat, begat Seth and, and Methuselah be, begat Lamech and there was a lot of begetting and begetting going on <laughs> and they lived to these old ages. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
these are the Hindu Manus and the ages that they live to are code for the actual durations of the root races. And I explain this code as being the 4320 cipher, right. which you multiply by those ages of the patriarchs to get the length of those sub races of Atlantis and, uh, and Lemuria. And it fits. Yeah. So that was, for me, a huge breakthrough. And I was able to prove that chronology working forwards and working backwards. And, and it's, it's there in the book. So, uh, but you have these stories of, you know, Moses and the bulrushes, for instance. This is an old Egyptian story, but you can find the story back in the Hindu tradition as well. Uh, in, and also in the Arcadian tradition and all those other civilizations, they have the same stories. Yeah. The flood of, uh, of, of the designated avatar being found in the river and, you know, so many things like that. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that the Hindu tradition, and by the way, Hindu is just a, an umbrella word. It's like in ancient Europe, mm -hmm. there was a lot of different traditions, religions. Exactly. We just call them pagans. Indeed. But they're not necessarily that right. connected to each other, and that's the same with the Hindu. The Hindu is still yeah. they're just a pagan survival from from the so it's the oldest. But well, well, well Blavatsky says that they were the last branch race of the first sub race, so they they there are actually right. other branch races associated that were actually older than the Hindu. So that's I, I hear Sri Lanka is, is the oldest. Well. No, I don't think so. The but well, yes. The Lemurian. Yes and no. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I do deal with this in a lot of detail in my new book, um, because Sri Lanka and the south of India, in fact, the island continent which was attached to Sri Lanka and has since sunk, yep. was actually the home of the original Mayans and Egyptians who, uh, around that time of the sinking, uh, about nine hundred thousand years ago, moved. Uh, westward towards Guatemala and and the source of the near the source of the Nile, mm. um, and established their civilizations there. So, but uh, Sri Lanka was an ancient part of Lemuria, and and so was this island that has since sunk to the south. But they were also part of Atlantis later on. Mm. Chunks chunks of them were. Mm. So um, these. These sub races or branch races of the, of the Hindus were in different parts of India at that time, and I don't think the ones in in, in Sri Lanka were the oldest, technically speaking. But it's kind of uh, you know it's 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 irrelevant in some ways. Yeah. Um, no. Are you familiar with a chap called Klaus Duna? Yes. Well, I was going to. I was thinking of him a while ago because Klaus Duna, because he is a friend of a friend of mine who is one of these people who is opening himself up apparently to much wider uh, or longer chronology. Yeah, because you know what he found? He found that, just to people who don't know who he is, he's uh, collecting... Artifacts. Artifacts, ancient, ancient artifacts. He's been doing it for a, a lifetime. And when you do that... Mm. Even if you're not even interested in these things, you can't avoid starting to notice stuff. And one of the things he found out was that <clears throat> antediluvian artifacts from all over the world, from really geographically speaking all over the world, had many similarities as to symbolism and language. And he found that it's a language that you can call a proto-Sanskrit. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that and that that proto Sanskrit uh, was then widespread, world spread. So it's obviously I don't know Atlantean or Lemurian, but yeah. but that goes to corroborate what we're talking. That's why the Hindu is probably the purest source because it hasn't been contaminated or, or yeah. strayed too much from that proto, that common source. If yes, you like. I, I think um, Klaus also establishes some relation between uh, the Harappan civilization around the Indus River. What did you call it? The Harappan and the uh, and Easter Island, I think, or him or someone else okay. through those artifacts. But of course, you know, many of these civilizations traveled. For instance, the Phoenicians, Ooh. who are supposed to, supposedly the greatest sailors and I designate as probably part of the second sub-race of the fifth root race, travel to many different areas in the world. America, and, for instance. Exactly. Uh, across the Pacific, uh, not just the Mediterranean and those places where they were based. Um, they went everywhere. 
yeah. as did other civilizations. So there was a lot of cross-fertilization and interaction and trade uh, that occurred back in those times. Yeah. So, yeah, but they were rulers of the sea for sure, the yeah. Phoenicians. And they, they, um, and so I break up in my new book. I break up all these different civilizations into uh, the, we have the Phoenicians, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, a bewildering array. You know, the Akkadians. Uh, I break them up into their particular sub races and root races, and hence I'm able to establish a timeline for which ones are older than the other. Right. For instance, the Phoenicians have got a very close relationship to India uh, originally. Hmm. And and so I, I document as uh, a lot of that as much as I can. And these are still only the broad outlines. I know somewhere down the track I can go into this much more, more deeply. Um, and, you know, my various travels around the world in the last 20 years, I've been on the road constantly for the last 10 years visiting a lot of these places to film, uh, to get footage for my documentaries, but also to uh, to connect with the places intuitively and, and see what they have to, to say to me. And uh, that information is invaluable. You, you can't get that in a book. And um, I have a lot of information that I haven't even shared yet around those kind of connections. Right. Um, okay, but... Let's. Uh, I have a specific question. When were we at this? Uh, we mentioned Gopleki Tepe. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Schock said that, and, and we've interviewed him. I don't know if you listened to that show, but he has found, or maybe it wasn't him, but he has at least reported that not only is it older than mm. the pyramids, maybe not the Sphinx. I mean, it's hard to date these things, but mm. uh, if you look at the refinery, mm. and, and here the thumb rule, of course, is that the older, the further back you go in time, the more advanced stuff is. So it's not this mainstream paradigm that we began primitively and then we become more and more advanced. That's that's what they would want you to believe. But if you, in fact, look at the facts, the further back you go, the more refined. Now, he found that in Göblaki Tepe, there's uh, probably a connection to the sound technology because... Yeah. Two huge columns were made in such a way that, because when they found them, when the mainstream ecologists found them, they thought that they were uh, grounded deep in the earth. But they found that they were made in such a way that they were able to resonate with each other like a tuning fork. Yeah. And that it was very uh, superficially uh, attached to the, to the ground. And so... You have this reson, and we know also that the law says that uh, in Egypt they built the pyramids with sound technology. Do, do you have any take on on this Gebelkitep and sound? Oh yeah, I haven't just I haven't explored Gebelkitep so much. I've read a lot of reports, mm. um, and I've noticed just recently too the some of the carvings on the stones are very similar to the carvings on the back of the Easter Island giants that they've excavated, you know, the wow. Easter Island heads that they've excavated. They've, they, they, if you look at the, the carvings on the back of those particular stones on the, on their, on the backs of these, these, um, these heads that were once below the earth, mm -hmm. they're very similar to, to the ones in Gobleki Tepe, which indicates great, great antiquity oh, yeah, um, and I've always seen Gobleki Tepe and some of the other underground cities and so forth in Turkey as being part of the old Atlantean constructions. Gobleki Tepe also brings to mind uh, the sound chamber in uh, Malta. Right. In that particular, um, uh, there are a lot of people have done some very interesting work on with, with, uh, with sound and, and acoustics. Right. So yes, uh, yeah, sound was used to build and to destroy. Uh, I think I mentioned in the essay that I talk about the um, uh, the ancient city of um, where where they marched the armies around the city and the walls fell down. What was it? Um, um, you know, the old city where they marched the armies around and they blew their trumpets and the walls fell down. Oh yeah, yeah, from the Bible. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the trumpet of um, it's called walls of um, Jericho. Jericho. There you have it. Yeah. Okay, so the so we're looking at sound destroying, and we have the ancient story of the army that walks around 
the walls of Jericho for seven days blowing trumpets and with a syncopated beat of their of the soldiers and their feet stamping on the ground with the uh, trumpets blowing and and this is ancient Atlantean magic that right. actually brought those walls tumbling down and then we have other and, and you talk about this in the film too do I yep. yeah and um, then we have other examples of where I talk about the uh, creation of of, uh, uh, of a vacuum in order to render the the atoms within stones weightless, to be able to be to place them like big chunks of foam effortlessly uh, in place, and also of course cutting instruments like that cuts the stones so finely, like at Cuzco for instance in in Peru, you have these these marvelous yep. curved joins in the stones that weigh up to 130 or 50 tonnes. Oh, yeah, and I found this in Gobekli Litepe too, so refined yes, that, exactly. that they had to have some kind of advanced yeah. machines to yeah. fit them. Yeah, and, and uh, well, even, you know, the story of Percy Fawcett looking for the lost city of Zed in, in South America, which allegedly was, he was looking for Shambhala that I mentioned before in the middle of um, one of those states in Brazil. He talks about a substance that he came across in the jungle that was from some plant or vine that had a softening effect on stone. Hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting story. You can read about it on the internet. There are plenty of stories about it. Um, so that, that was a, a, another theory that, that that may have been used in ancient times, but I, I think it was, more, it was a more sophisticated thing to do with, with the science of sound. And, of course, sound can be abused and misused or sure. uh, used as a weapon. In fact, of course, these modern weapons, these horrifying weapons they're developing now are based on sound. Mm. That, that completely shut, will shut down a demonstration in, in two seconds. Sure. I mean, as Tesla even started to discover, both light spectre and sound spectre has huge potentiality, but obviously everything that can be used for constructing or, or, or healing or whatever mm -hmm. can also be used for destruct, unfortunately. And I guess it depends on consciousness. Yeah, yeah. and so the with the pyramids, we have, um, you know, most definitely would have been used with that technology. But that's it gives the age of the Great Pyramid is around 87,000 years. Now, does she mention the Sphinx? Yes, yeah, she does, but I can't remember what age she ascribes to it, but I think it's it's much older than what, you know, what the uh, mainstream is. Yeah, I, mean, I think it was Shwala de Lubitsch who first argued for that, yes. and uh, then it was substantiated by Robert Schock and Anthony West. That yes, is exactly. even earlier than the pyramids. Yes. Uh, Delibitz did some marvelous work. I, I read most of his books many years ago. He's excellent. And so, um, and when you go to Egypt and you you go to the uh, to Saqqara, mm -hmm. you you see the difference in age. It's much much older than the than, than the site of Giza. Yeah, it's it's probably I, I estimate maybe four hundred thousand years or older. Uh, mm -hmm. It's way way older than than Giza. And then you have, of course, many buried ruins all around Egypt that, that haven't been found yet. Yeah. Uh, we've been and and there's, there's, there's some satellite archaeology that shows that there's an mm -hmm. incredible amount of pyramids buried yes. that hasn't been unearthed yet. Yes. And this is happening all around the world now, and people are examining Google Earth for yeah. the bottom of the ocean. And there's pyramids all over the Earth, yeah. even sunken pyramids, and even in Antarctica. Yeah, under the ice, right. So this is very exciting because it's uh, it's uh, captured a lot of people's imagination and there's more yep. and more research being done on it. And the truth will come out eventually during this Aquarian age that we're going into. Mm. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's it's accelerating at the moment. And this is very exciting. And I like to think that in our small way, we are contributing to this Absolutely. disclosure. Now, I have, I have so many notes. I hope you have time to go through them all. Sure. Um, let me start with, you mentioned that there were electrical storms. And you mentioned, by the way, are you aware of the electrical universe paradigm that's fighting its way into science? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, I've, I've been to. You in favor of that? or? Um, 
If it's the same one we're talking about, are you talking Thunderbolts of the Gods and all that stuff? Thunderbolt project, yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Now, are we going to have some of them on to later? Now, when humanity fell into this split then, uh, into duality, I guess, the, the, the duality consciousness, which according to the Pythagoreans was a fall, they call it a fall, Mm. Uh, and I guess that's when we became genders and got two eyes. Would would you say? Would you agree that that's what uh, referred to as the four? Yeah, I can see the the truth in that. You know, in a sense, if we've come from spirit, from the one, we in coming into manifestation, with we come into a dual existence. Especially if we look at the the uh, disconnect between spirit and matter. Yeah. And so, you know, the, all the dual aspects of the human being, the two eyes, two hands, two arms, two legs, etc., two halves of the brain, and we're finding our way back to that unity, uh, which will occur at liberation when we, when we take that, that uh, final initiation and become liberated from earth consciousness and don't have to return here anymore. Right. So, um, yes, the Pythagorean tradition, of course, which... Uh, we're told that Pythagoras was a previous incarnation of the Master Kutumi, mm. and um, who is in line to take the uh, the next office of the Christ. We're told too, mm. the the Christ being an office that that is vacated and filled at various cycles. So yeah, there, there is truth in that. So in this uh, system, the Christ is the the chief avatar for an age. Well, is it? If we look at the uh, the beings who stand behind, behind humanity and watch over human evolution, uh, not interfering with human karmic free will as much as possible. Shepherds, gardeners of, of humanity. Well, um, you're looking at, at the Christ being the master of all the masters and who is in direct connection with uh, the one we call Senakamara uh, in Shambhala, who, who holds the country. Purpose and plan. Yeah, now you go, go we're going deep into theosophic. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that being who held the office of the Christ two thousand years ago, I've just been writing about this today in my latest newsletter hmm. for Scorpio, is is due to return again uncharacteristically because usually it's it doesn't work like this, but but he's coming back again into physical manifestation for the age of Aquarius, as the avatar for the age of Aquarius. When is he scheduled to appear? Well, the date for the reappearance and externalization of all those who precede him, the other masters and, and disciples of the various ashrams, is slated to begin in 2025 onwards. Wow, that's in our lifetime. So it's we're, the, we're right there now. Uh, hang on, will he be born around then, or will he start working around then? Well, you know, the they can take bodies or build bodies, these beings, they, they, oh, they okay. have to be born by the usual means. So I think he's probably already built himself a special body to return in that can withstand the impacts of of the energies of Earth life. But um, uh, And I thought it was interesting recently that they have this um, long-lost Da Vinci painting turn up uh, Salvatore Mundi, the saviour of the world, most exquisite painting of the Christ that I've ever seen, actually, um, as somewhat of a, a sign of Christ, if you like. Interesting. Da Vinci was an initiated Pythagorean, by the way. He was an advanced initiate, probably, yeah, the, yeah. probably a fourth-degree initiate, extraordinary being. So a, a master painter with his picture of the master, uh, I thought was an extraordinary um, symbol. And in this time of world crisis, particularly, uh, as an inspiration, and the painting is going to auction in mid, mid November, I suspect that it may, t may take a, make a huge amount of, uh, of money to buy it. <laughs> you can bet on that. Well, it's starting at 100 million, but I think it may actually be a lot more than that. But the other thing that I, I noticed was that. Um, he did this painting around the same time that he completed the Mona Lisa, mm. which has the same androgynous, enigmatic energy about it mm. that Salvatore uh, Mundi does. And um, uh, they're almost like a pair of paintings, both of them androgynous, uh, both of them with this extraordinary energy. So, yes, the, we are in the time of the forerunner, we've been told, 
uh, of the uh, of the reappearance of these masters of wisdom who uh, we're also being told have not appeared amongst humanity since the ancient days of Atlantis. It's about freaking time. <laughs> So after that war, they had to withdraw uh, and stand behind the scenes. But in those days, they walked amongst humanity. So we are... Really Look, if, if you're out there, you better hurry. <laughs> I mean, we're in deep, deep trouble. So, yeah, <laughs> it's about time. Well, I think this is an, a massed invoked cry from humanity yeah. for that return. And it will happen because it, it's going to be unfolding as it should do in the right cycle. And that cycle we are right in now. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it, because I know you have, uh, <clears throat> you have a talent for also political understanding. One maybe wouldn't think that when people are, you know, experts in some areas, one thinks that they can't master others, but I've kept an eye on you. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I, I know you have a sound understanding of politics and <clears throat> you probably recognize then that there's a battle right now between those who want to control and keep us down oh, yeah. and uh, from the top, I guess, and the more organic bottom-up awakening happening, yes. the longing for, for real freedom. Yeah. Uh, because in, in my mind, you know, it's it's a, an alluring thought that's behind these totalitarian systems that we have to shepherd humanity. We have to force everything into this or that. But the problem is it doesn't work, be it fascism or communism, because... The, who ascends to the top? Never those who should be ruling us because they don't seek power. Yeah. Usually it's it's people who, who who can't handle and, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So I found that the best grounds for development is actually freedom. It's actually the liberty to, mm. you know, you're a kid, you go out, you stumble and you fall and you learn that that hurts. Yeah. If you're going to shepherd the kid so he can't experiment, he can't explore, he'll, he'll become a frightened little animal in a cage. Yeah. And that's what they're doing to humankind. Yes, there are two points that come up here um, that are worth mentioning. One is that I regard this particular phase that we're in now as the third phase of the World War. Uh, and right. that it hasn't broken out on the physical plane. It's raging upon the mental plane, however, in terms of ideologies and so forth. Yeah. Um, and the World War One and Two were regarded esoterically as one war and as a recapitulation of the ancient Atlantean conflict. Oh. So the same forces were involved in World War One and Two as as back then. And those materialistic forces, the forces of light, the forces of darkness, if you want to put it into the simple Lord of the Rings terms, <laughs> yeah. um, then you have you have this battle and that was contained to a degree in World War Two, but the the door where so called evil dwells has drifted ajar since then. And those materialistic forces have refined and consolidated their position ever more so. And because they know of this plan of the reappearance 2025 onwards and they're fighting tooth and nail to keep the status quo as it is yeah. and that's, this is what we're up against all the light workers of the world must really rally to the cry now and, and really work very hard subjectively and objectively to, to prevent their, their triumph because back in Atlantean times from one point of view they did triumph Mm. Even we, we, we have the numbers, we have the flow, but they have, well, maybe I should say the technology or the secrets that they keep from us, you know, to put us down. So, so that evens the battlefield, which makes it very exciting how st stuff will turn out. Indeed. Um, and... Yeah. Well, but you say the First World War and the Second World War, they, oh, yeah, they are one big war. And you can throw the Cold War in, in there too. Yeah, yeah. And um, so... I mean, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't really stopped, has it? No, but it, it, it seems it's going the right way because it goes from brute, primitive, physical conflict and then it uh, kind of uh, crystallizes in the Cold War. Yeah. And now it's up in the mental plane, you know. Cyber war. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, light, light war, we could call it. Yeah. <laughs> Apropos electrical universe. <laughs> but, um, hey, I, we, we have to jump to uh, other uh, yes, aspects yes. of this. Um, yeah. Antarctica. Mm -hmm. I'm going to interview a chap 
who has some exploding information that's very hard to find out there. I, I would think it would have taken off by now. But this chap, I think he's a Brit. He wrote a book, a uh, uh, fiction, uh, about the ancient civilization on Antarctis based upon facts because they found, according to reports, something in Antarctica. And there's a lot of rumors about this, but he has some concrete information. And uh, everybody says, oh, Atlantis, Atlantis, under ice, underwater. Again, Atlantis isn't a place. So, uh, But the interesting thing here is that we have some specifics. We have datings. We have stuff from the language. We have some artifacts. And he's going to count for all this. What's your, or rather, what's the esoteric view on Antarctica? Well, uh I've looked into some of these reports that you're talking about and over the years and the, the supposed pyramids and so forth, and uh, uh, there may be some truth in it. I don't know enough to really say, but I do know that Antarctica has been one of the oldest extent continents on the planet. Uh, it's been there for a very, very long time. And, um, and you know, of course, about the maps of the ice-free Yes, I've seen those maps, um, the ancient sea kings maps and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, Piri Rose. And this is what I want to go into more in my next book. So I haven't really done okay. I've got a lot of research sitting in files waiting to go through and, and apply all that according to the Aegis Wisdom tradition. So I'm pretty, pretty clueless on Antarctica generally. Well, I'll, I'll just – actually, I'm going to send you the program when we've done it and you can hear right. what he's yeah. referring and see if you can find his sources. Sure. Because according to him, we recently, like, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or something, I'm just taking this out of my ass, but it's it's just to give you a time frame. Yes. We've made discoveries there that hasn't gone public yet, but it's leaked. Yeah. And there's a lot of interesting stuff. So mm -hmm. apparently they were living uh, kind of a golden age thing. And I mean, if there were people there, we know when, mm -hmm. because we know when there wasn't ice there. And exactly. That's long ago. You know, they found these... Um, fossilized trees and ferns in the Arctic region, which indicated that there was no ice there at one stage. It had a tropical climate, and there's no reason why, therefore, Antarctica yeah. would not have had different climates at different times. It would be amazing if Antarctica was the only continent on the Earth where there never lived man. So, Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So, But uh, related to this uh, speculative... Um, fashion uh, fascinating uh, subject because th there there is like trends out there uh, when it comes to these things antarctica is one of them another big one of course and we can't avoid talking about it is the interplanetary reality mm -hmm. and uh, even aliens and all that stuff i want to say i want to say one thing before uh, i give you the ball and that is that I mentioned maps, and we're going to also interview a lady who has a lot of... Uh, we're going to interview several people who's into maps, and they have... It's many, many ancient maps. It's incredible. Yes. Notwithstanding um, in the East, China, ancient Chinese maps yeah. and stuff like that, and they show just incredible wow, stuff. But I, I want to say, when it comes to China... They have a very interesting story. I'm, I'm not too familiar with the Chinese uh, lore, so I can't give specifics. I'm going to have experts on who can account for this. So this is just my third way uh, to try to communicate this. But mm. there was in a period in China, it was forbidden to write fiction, actually. The emperor forbid it. So everything that was printed then was perceived by them to be factual. Yes. And one of the accounts we have from there is when it's about an even older time in China when they built what we can just call spaceships that they sent to the moon. And they talk about how they experienced the moon and they gave descriptions which are eerily similar yeah. to how we now know the moon is and, and this glass aspect and everything. And they said that they even erected a city there. But the problem was that the people revolted because this was so expensive that they started to starve. <laughs> so it reminds me of today, right? So they uh, had to abandon the whole moon project. Oh. And of course, there's also this very famous thing in Chinese mythology that was referenced when uh, the Apollo 11 landed. Uh, Houston said some weird thing about, hey, if you see a Chinese princess up there, 
<laughs> Talos. And that's a reference to the myth where a, a Chinese princess was abducted and taken to the moon. So if you look at ancient, uh, in this case, Chinese, you see that we have stories about interplanetary travel. Yeah. Now, does the esoteric lore say anything about this or that can be interpreted? Oh, in this regard, absolutely. I, I mean, I, just one clue is Vimanos, right? Yes, exactly. That's what I was going to say. I talk about that in the video. Mm. That Vimana technology has been around since the Mahabharata time, the four million years ago. That's been technology that has been gifted to humanity. One of the one of the technologies that's been gifted to humanity, and um, uh, there are depictions of that war being fought out in in uh, in art and and uh, etched in stone of those uh, conflicts uh, of those Vimana being used. So if those you know, what we commonly call UFOs today, different shapes and sizes uh, from the um, Vimana Shastra that they appear in. Um, and so if they can, those same craft can go interplanetary travel or beyond the solar system that we know of in this day and age, there's no reason why they could not have done it in, in back then. So the so-called ancient astronauts uh, would mm. probably just be human beings. Well, you know the the show that um, the the ancient alien show, which which posits that could these beings be ancient aliens, is has got a grain of truth in it, of course. Although I find that that show tends to to ascribe everything to ancient aliens. Exactly. I, I usually tell people, hey, watch the show because <laughs> they focus upon real mysteries, yes. but don't necessarily buy into the explanation yeah. because it's just a knee jerk alien, alien, alien. It's like. Exactly. We never achieved anything on Earth. Yes, and um, yeah, but they've got some excellent commentators on there, like David David Hedge Childress. I think Michael Cremer was on there once. Yeah, and I've asked many of them, and and they say that they doesn't doesn't necessarily no. support no. an alien. It's just that they use them be, because of their work. Yes, but the research and the and the footage on all the sacred sites around the planet is just excellent. Yeah, and so uh, it's it's very stimulating in that respect. And um, absolutely. So there is a possibility that uh, we had, you know, visitors from another planet, perhaps Venus, because Venus is esoterically regarded as the highest self to this planet. We have a very close karmic relation with Venus, apparently. It is possible that, that their more advanced civilization helped to seed this planet. In fact, they did, uh, but that's a more esoteric story. And that that even human DNA may have been let, loaned to us or supplied, as many theorists claim. Mm. So there's, there's truth in all those things, but I, I can't validate it 100%, obviously. Of course, but, I mean, just if we can have the speculation, that the dare uh, entertain the scenario, I mean. Absolutely. Then, uh, then we can see that, okay, if we once upon a time had the capability to, for instance, wage advanced wars with nuclear weapons like they found they found um dr yes. brandenburg yes. has proven that on mars there's been nuclear weapon because of the signature it's not natural radiation it's yes. from nuclear weapons the same we have in iraq and we have in india yeah. and so if we had th those capabilities and we had the capabilities to fly like you point out with the vimanas and stuff then and like uh, some ancient Stuff also said we went to at least to the moon, maybe other other planets. Then there could be breakaway civilizations that went on, and while we fell down here into decay, yeah. some of them may have survived out there. Yeah, uh, the esoteric tradition talks about how the essential essences of our souls that we call monads are associated with different plants in the solar system. Mm -hmm. We have these micro um, evolutions within the earth that I talk about in my hidden history book, which is essentially a microcosm of the entire solar system. Mm -hmm. So I, I talk about the, the earth scheme that has seven chains of worlds within it, each with seven globes in each chain which amounts to 49 globes or incarnations of, of who we call the country logo. I have to say, when I saw that in your film, that's the first time I've seen 
someone being able to explain it in a way yeah. that uh, anyone can understand it and when yeah. they haven't seen it before. That's very well done by you. So people should, Thank you. instead of trying to understand what you're saying now, they should really just see that because you illustrate it so beautifully. This, this helps us understand the continuum of time yeah. and the fact that this earth is that is in the 24th incarnation of 49 incarnations. <laughs> so there's a ways to go yet. Yeah. Um, and that the, in fact, the middle of the Atlantean period was the middle of the entire uh, scheme period. Uh, in other words, the middle point of evolution for the entire earth that has been designated for the earth to reach a certain point of, of consciousness through the uh, seven root races that move through the so-called seven rounds or, or cycles. So um, that is one of the key factors that I, I tried to bring out in, in that. And, um, and so we can, we can go to these other worlds, subjectively speaking, these other globes within the earth scheme, which are reflections of, for instance, the, the Venus globe of the Venus chain of the Earth scheme is not Venus per se, but it is connected to the planet Venus mm. uh, subjectively, and and all the other planets within the solar system are connected to one another. It's it's one great body of of energy centers or chakras. I mean, they, they, they can't. That's almost no denying anymore that Mars obviously had some kind of um, inhabitation of mm. of advanced. Uh, beings okay. but due, just due to the evidence yeah. but I, I wonder if you have a comment upon another aspect of this yeah. thing and that is i'll just give a few examples but many people are written about it i mentioned hoagland to you i think it was before we began yeah. and uh, also dr farrell has written about the cosmic war there, there seems to be accounts of war in heaven yes and when you and when you observe like you have um, uh, Tom van Flanden, brilliant scientist, unfortunately he died before his time, but mm. he has more or less proven that he hasn't been able to be debunked, and believe me, they tried, a renegade NASA scientist who proven that between Mars and Jupiter there was a gigantic planet, that, uh, basically a water planet. Yeah. Now, obviously he's a scientist, so he can speculate too much, but he goes a long way to indicate that it could have had uh, not just life, but intelligent life. And he has found evidence for when it exploded. I, I don't remember, the ex it may have been 65 million years ago, but it exploded. And uh, that's probably also a source to a flood because if you look at Mars, half of Mars that was uh, angled towards it mm -hmm. is, f is just devastated, full of craters. Mm. The other half that was towards Earth, I guess you could say, it, is not marked as that. And uh, imagine all this water being thrown towards Earth and, and uh, in that direction. And it was so big that people who lived there would have to be giants, mm -hmm. if you see, mm -hmm. to catch my drift. So this, and many people think that it was taken down by extremely advanced weapons, uh, obviously, and all the technology and what we're doing now, and probably manipulating the ether or whatever. So what's your take on this cosmic war, war in heaven, exploded planets? Um... Uh, I haven't heard of that one. I've heard of other theories like Velikovsky's and, and uh, Zachariah Sitchin and so forth, which I don't buy, by the way. One... No, 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 but Tom van Flandern was a scientist. But this one, this one, well, yeah, he's a scientist. He's a, he's a fallible man. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not. It could be. But I, it's not really my area of, uh, of inquiry, right. so I can't really give you an informed uh, answer on that. But I will say that these wars in heaven are far more symbolic mm. rather than physical. And this is one of the things, the problems with the, uh, the materialistic viewpoint of Ancient Aliens TV show that we were just talking about. Mm. It always tries, it, it so ma materializes everything and this has been a problem that I point out in my yuga cycles. These people are taking the 12,000 years of the gods literally, when in fact that figure has to be multiplied by 360 to get the true figures. Right. Uh, because of the fact that the evolution, the paradigm at the moment is everything's 
dumbed down into a neat 10,000 years of human history. Yeah. So likewise, I see these these uh, these other speculations as some of them, not all of them, but but as as more materialistic interpretations of something that is far more esoteric. Mm. Um, and Blavatsky does talk about the that that not all was in harmony with the gods. Uh, at various times, and she's talking about the planets within the solar system, you know, integrating themselves within the 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 body of the of the solar logos or the solar system. Hmm. So um, that's about all I could really say on that now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I want to say it's actually a little in your area. You should read Tom von Flandern because yeah. uh, you're you're an uh, astrologist and. He- I mean, obviously, if there was a planet uh, that, and of course, the the remnants are now what we call the asteroid belt. Yeah, yeah. But he has also shown uh, one of the ways to prove this is that he has shown the origins of all the comets because you can calculate yeah. that everything was coming from one single point uh, yeah. where this this planet was. I, I think the biggest chunk of it today is Ceres. That's right. Yes, yeah. yeah, and he explains this isn't theories like. Sitchin and stuff, interpretations. This is just observations of scientific facts. He, he, can, he shows where the comets and the asteroid belt, and I think even some of the stuff further out in the solar system, all originated from this one point. That's how we can calculate when, yeah. it, when it exploded, because if you follow their cycles, it all goes back to... Yeah. And if this is real, then I think we should find allusions to it in the ancient lore. Yeah. I want to also say one thing in defense of Blavatsky, by the way, while I'm first on a rambling roll here, <laughs> and I'll give you, you the word back. And that is, one of the reasons I love her is, okay, she was a woman in a time where women hardly ever even got an education. Mm. She was a bright woman, and I mean, check her life. It was incredible, quite an advantage. But in her adventures, she also uh, discovered stuff. And... Uh, and by the way, the way she battled the scientists on their own premises, yes. she was an iconoclast. Just read. And she wasn't even this meek, oh, peace and love. I mean, no. she had a sharp tongue, man. <laughs> she had a yeah. sharp tongue. It's so uh, <laughs> entertaining to read how she just debunks these materialist scientists. But anyway, I was saying, a teacher of mine, a mentor of sorts, he had uh, a huge network, also in Esoterica, and uh, an expert in, I think, it, in theologist or something like that, Tibetan stuff. He found, they discovered an ancient manuscript that has to be the origin of what uh, Blavatsky called um, the stanzas of Tsion. That's right. What, uh, yeah. So we found, they found this manuscripts, which people accused her of just dreaming it up. But this is evidence that it was a real text. Oh, yes. There, there's a set that is kept in most Tibetan monasteries of the various versions of the stanzas of Tsion. That is the skeleton of the secret doctrine which Blavatsky fleshes out with her commentary. Right. With the aid of the masters, yeah. Is, is this the... So it's a, it's a real book that comes down to us from Atlantean times, from pre-Sanskrit times. Yeah, the, is this the, the, uh, Buddh- the esoteric Buddhism called... Um, oh, the name slips me. You know, the Buddhists have different uh, names, different traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah. Nyingma or something like that? No, no. Um, Vajrayana Buddhism? Not Vajrayana. Uh, it's a specific... I think they're acknowledged by the Dalai Lama. Yeah. It's called um, um, Kala Chakra. Oh, of course, the Kala Chakra teachings. And it is said that the the books of Blavatsky and also of Alice Bailey, which is a continuation of, of those teachings, uh, constitute two-thirds of the Kala Chakra teachings. Right. And the the book of Zian is 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 central to that, and Kala Chakra is really uh, a map of the the planetary crown chakra, which is Shambhala. Hmm. And there's a there's a three D four D animation that you can find on the internet about this uh, on on a on a video of that round mandala that most people recognise as the as the Kala Chakra, actually as a as a three D building. A temple, but it's so weird because 
My introduction to Shambhala was Nicholas Rurish, and also I read a lot from Goodwin about this. And you also have the concept of Agartha, by the way. Maybe you can explain yes, that yes. too. But all of them place it in the Himalayas, in the Gobi, in the Central Asia, Altai. Uh, but you say its origin is in South America. Well, that was the first outpost in Lemurian times. And then later on, it moved to the ancient Mayan institutions around Guatemala, southern Mexico. Uh And then later for the fifth root race, it moved to the Gobi Desert, all an etheric substance, of course. But back in Lemurian times, it was in physical, a physical temple. So there's been three Shambhalas for the three root races. And now as we're going into the sixth root race, Shambhala returns full circle to the original Shambhala in South America, and it will be activated. I think all three Shambhala locations are activated, but Sanakamara, the Lord of the World, as he's called, is I think in the in the one in the Gobi Desert for to to somewhat materialize the idea, but they're all active centers, right. and there are certain uh, so-called Ibezian workers from this Temple of Ibez who uh, uh, apparently are there now working and various people have been selected from different parts of the world to who are at a certain stage of unfoldment to and and who are suited for this kind of subjective work to actually physically work there and live there and of course there are rumors of underground um, uh, yeah. races and civilizations as well that um, that Percy Fawcett went to uh, talked about as well on his travels. And that they're connected across the globe, underground. Yeah. Many tunnels. Yeah. Of course, in Peru and Bolivia, there are, you know, uh, Blavatsky talks about the tunnels, and uh, many other authors have, of course, that stretch right across the globe, are connected to various sacred sites that were built during the Atlantean uh, floods for protection. Uh, I'm not sure how that actually worked, but so... Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the Egyptians went underground to yeah. to avoid the catastrophe. Uh, and it's a huge... In, and then there's the whole world. We're not even go there today. Yeah. <laughs> but, but by the way, uh, Kathmandu, what's that country called again? The Kathmandu? Yeah. Uh, I, I did talk about Kathmandu in a, in a newsletter a couple of years ago when the Nepalese earthquake occurred. Ne- Nepal, that's it. Because I want, I want to go and yes. ask you that... There's so incredible similarity between Peru, Bolivia, yeah, yeah, and the Nepalese. And I noticed it's like the, it's like the, the same people. And I was thinking yeah. because if you look at the Basque people in Spain and the Georgian people, mm. you have this uh, the flood theory that yeah. when migrations happened, uh, the original inhabitants uh, arise higher and higher up the mountains, and that's how you can have. In Europe, the oldest people in Basque and in Georgia, which are not Indo-Europeans, and they have incredible similar culture because they were once all over that place. Is it the same when we talk about Peru, Bolivia, Nepal, even though the distances are so huge? Absolutely. And this is another one of the keys to the hidden history of humanity. The Basques, Blavatsky does talk about in relation to Atlantis and the Atlantean continents, which of course are right next to, to Spain and, and Portugal. Um, so there, there she makes a very specific reference about, in, in fact, quite a few pages on the Basques, as I recall. I've got hidden away in one of my files. Um, wow. And as regards to South America, you know, the, the Aymara indigenous tribes there look very similar to the Tibetans. And yeah. they have a tradition there of Nuach who is the South American Noah, who came there in an ark during the Atlantean floods and rescued them. And so my theory has been that this Noah's ark was both a symbolic and an actual story. Mm. The the Manu, uh, Noah was the Manu, Vaivasvata Manu, as he's called in the Hindu tradition, of the fifth root race. Right. And this ark was basically rescuing and, and, and scavenging the remnants of destroyed humanity at that time from Atlantean and Lemurian sub-races. And it's, it's a fantastic, it sounds like a fantastic, improbable story, but I, I think it's actually literal as well as symbolic. Mm. Um, symbolism I go into in my book a bit more, but just the literal side of it is that those remnants of humanity were rescued 
and this is what's meant by the the uh, the animals going on board the ark two by two. It's not literally animals, although that may have happened as well. It's actually human beings. Um, and I, I, thought, I thought it was like um, uh, you have the in Svalbard you have the uh, seed bank, right? I thought it was like genes they were uh, taking. Yes, surviving. you could interpret it like that, but but uh, I see the animals as being the humans who. The Manu rounded up, rescued, and took back to somewhere, a location somewhere in the Himalayas, right. uh, where they, he, in a sense, bred them into a new race over a period of a few million years. And they were finally released, if you like, uh, uh, to simplify matters, um, down into, into northern India, mm. which was the seat. This is a million years ago. They were released into India as the first sub race of the of the fifth root race and with all the in this in their such a yuga if you like with all their perfections and 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 ideals of what that race was to achieve right and so so that's that that's the uh, story that I cover in in chapter six of my um, my unveiling Genesis book Noah and all the descendants of Noah such as uh, Menes, the the Egyptian uh, Manu, Abraham, the Semitic Manu, uh, and Joseph, Jacob, and and so forth, all the sons who are subsequent Manus of the of the various sub races of the fifth root race. Mm. Well, I have to say, taking up a note you said there that. Esoterica is nothing if not multi-layered. Yes. So it's very true what you say. You can never, always in esoterica, or if we're dealing with symbolism or myths or, or, or even stuff that's presented yeah. as factual, there's always several layers to them, which means that something can both be, and you see the same in ast- uh, astrology and stuff too, stuff can both be actual ref- historical references, that's the lowest level of truth, Yes. Then it can be allegorical references, like many myths are also education tools for human consciousness. Yeah. And then it can be more, even more esoteric level to it, which is the spiritual truth or the cosmic yeah. uh, truths. And that's that's the that's that's ABC in esoteric, and people need to know this. So it's not an either or; is usually a both and, and then some. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And the ark is symbolically representative of the uh, the womb that births humanity. Oh, uh, yes, right. the shape of the vesica Pisces look, 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 looked at from the from the uh, from the air, and it there's a whole spiel about that Blavatsky gives about this in the Secret Doctrine, yeah. where um, uh, Noah's ark, Vivasvata Manu, is actually the name of the Manu that brought in the Lemurian race. He's the big Manu, if you like. There are many sub-race Manu <laughs> that can have the same name. Some of these names are used generically. Right. But anyway, uh, the Yark stands for that that creation uh, and birth of humanity as souls back, in, back at the time of individualization in Lemuria. Right. Hey, um, what about Agartha? Does that... and, yes, I'll just get to that. I'll just... Something else that we, we were going to cover before, while I think of it, uh, at individualization, hum, this is in about the, this occurred for over a three million year period between 21.6 and 18.6 million years ago, and over several sub races from the third sub race of Lemuria to the fifth sub race. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> the fifth sub race saw that that completion of the various groups of humanity who are being individualized, but also in that three million year period, they transform from being hermaphrodite humanity to being two sex beings and who reproduce, start to reproduce in the same way we do today. So that's an extraordinarily important time in esoteric history, which I keep coming back to time and time again, because there are so many secrets and mysteries hidden there. Uh, about the the various sub races and root races today that have their genesis back at that time, very very interesting hmm. area. So Agatha, I um, have I think I read the book by I can't remember the author's name many years ago. One of the from the nineteenth century. Uh, no, a bit later than that. Because um, you have sunk to Evis. But, uh, apparently, it's the it's the but, but I'm not really that well informed. But I see it as the basically it's the dark version of Shambhala. 
Oh, right, right. Is, is that what you, you, you were thinking of? Well, I know there's many books, so I'm not well, referring to a specific one, but I, I know for sure that uh, Nicholas... So tell, me, tell, tell me what Agatha is to you. To me, it's just... I, I don't pretend to know what it is, but I, I do sympathize with um, some of the... I don't know if you're familiar with the Martinism. Yes. It's a French yeah, esoteric tradition. They had so a lot. It's a Rosicrucian tradition. Yeah, it's a Rosicrucian tradition. They they had a lot yeah. about... Uh, uh, yeah. can, I have like archives of mm. even dead esoteric orders. I have huge archives of okay. schools that used to operate and some operate still. Mm-hmm. And if you read in some of that lore, you'll see that <laughs> there's a lot of stuff... Oh paralleling the theosophic lore, which corroborates the theosophic okay. That's one of the reasons so, I'm... Does it, does it talk about Agatha as being Shambhala or being the dark equivalent? Some do, some conflate, some that, say... That's, that's what I've seen over the years. I've seen contradictions yeah. Yeah. around it. Yeah. But uh, Nicholas Rurish and Lama Govinda, both those dudes mm. were of, of the light, I'm sure. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. So major emissaries. Of, of the work, yeah. Yeah, and both of them talk about Shambhala and Agartha too. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly. I, I've read the book on Shambhala by Rurik, and, of course, I use his paintings extensively in my newsletters. Uh, I've read his other books. In fact, I've, I've visited uh, Nicholas and Helena Rurik's house in, in wow. India. Um, cool. Where they, they lived in the Kulu Valley. and uh, No, did they live in Kulu? I've been yeah. in the Kulu Valley. Ah, yeah. Yeah, they had a house. Oh, and I didn't visit their house. Yeah. I didn't know. Oh, my God. What a waste of travel. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I actually got to go upstairs, which is forbidden for most people. And the It's dangerous, the mafia, you know, drug trade. Uh, I got to know the caretaker who took me upstairs and showed me all the artifacts from their trips, wow. showed me Helena Rurik's desk where all... Yeah, all her books and study books were and so forth. Yeah, it was very interesting. God, what a waste of a journey. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, anyway, that's interesting. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you recognize his contribution to this. Yeah. As, oh, uh, most definitely. Helena and Nicholas Rorick, uh, I put in the same, in, in the trinity of, of Bailey and Blavatsky and Rorick. In fact, there's an, uh, a, a Facebook group called BBR, which stands for Bailey, Blavatsky, Rurik, people who uh, see those three sets of teachings as the, as the major foundation for the uh, new new cycle we're going into. Yeah. Uh, that, that, were, that were all transmitted by the masters, various masters, to their amanuenses. Yeah, obviously, Agni Yoga would be his manifestation, but, but yes. if you look at his education, he's well-versed in the Western tradition too. Rurish, yes, that yeah, is. Yeah, well, well, it was Helena who was the amanuensis. He was the artist and mm. probably probably older spiritually than her. And uh, their their work together was amazing. Mm. And and he reminds me also of Lama Govinda, both in the. I said, Bo, Blavatsky, Gurdjieff, Lama Govinda, and Rurish, they had many yeah. things common. First off, they were yes. travelers in the same areas looking for the same sources. Mm. All of them claim to have uh, or are proven to have some kind yeah. of connection. Yes. And especially Rurish and Govinda was excellent artists. Yes. Oh, well, Govinda was a, was definitely an advanced disciple. And a few other people like him, like uh, uh, who was that woman? Uh, Alexander, Alexander David Neal. Oh, yeah. Her. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, who wrote the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Uh, right. Right. Classic. Yeah. I can't remember the guy's name. Anyway, yeah. Uh, maybe you were talking about Ivan Swentz or something like that? Oh, Ivan Swentz, yes, that's the, yeah, yes. That's the one. Yeah, right. yeah. When, we're, uh, when we're at name dropping, um, <laughs> we could also name, um, I don't know your relation to the w- woman who helped Sri Ogobindo. What's it? Oh, uh, the uh, mother? Mother, mother, yeah, yes, mother. I, I visited the mother at the Oroville because I loved Aurobindo's writings. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he was an advanced initiate who helped to bridge the East and West. They did great work, as did many other uh, teachers like Aurobindo. Okay, so you acknowledge uh, Aurobindo's work. I think that's an important message because I, I agree with you there. Yeah, I think. and people like Vivekananda and yeah. Ramana Maharshi, all those guys, they did wonderful work. Yeah. 
And and I'm not even well versed in Eastern, but I managed to understand that those guys contributed. I guess it's just more more. It's, it's not really. You mean that they're, they're part of the whole picture, but it's not really a direct history. So. Mm. No, no. But there were many contributors, you know, in mm. in the world, and I, I think some kudos um, we can afford to give them. Absolutely. Actually, there is one thing I can mention. Yeah. You know, Yogananda's master, who was. Uh, What's his name? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Ram, Ram, no, not Ramakrishna. No. Yogananda's master. Yukishwa. Um, Yukishwa. Yeah. Yukishwa. Yukishwa Giri. Okay. Yeah. Yogananda's master, uh, Swami Yukishwa, who is probably a very advanced being. You know, I think Yogananda as the great swan is, is really a name for the, for the fourth initiation, mm -hmm. uh, which is the liberation initiation par excellence. And, and, and who knows where Yukishwa was at, but it must have been around the same stage of unfoldment. However, Yukteswar's teaching on the Yugas has been very distorted. I think Yukteswar deliberately dumbed down those teachings on the um, oh. Yuga cycles into the neat 12,000 year uh, paradigm right. that other scholars have gone and written long essays about because of the authority that Yukteswar has spiritually. Um, I think he dumbed it down deliberately for the Western mind and to not to, to keep the devotees uh, engaged. And, um, you know, the American and European devotees, if you're Yogananda, and to not challenge, obviously, too much the Western mind with these extraordinarily long yoga cycles that, that I go into. So it's right. important to, to note that because I see many authors who, who reference uh, Yukteswa as an unassailable authority on the Yugas, when in fact it is very veiled teaching that has been you know, compressed into a much smaller cycle. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so that's on the record. Now let's wrap this up here. Mm -hmm. um, let's just uh, first, before we leave here, um, your film like we mentioned, Hidden History of Humanity, or HHH, as we can call it, yeah. is in two parts. It's in one part on YouTube, but you seem to allude to more parts coming out. What's your plan there? Well, um, it was released originally on Vimeo in part one and then in part two. So there's two parts on, on Vimeo, but those two parts have been joined together now on YouTube as one part, two hours. And you can see it for free, by the way, people. It's all for you can free. download it as well for free. Yep. Um, donations are appreciated. So if you go to my website where there's a link to the video, there's also a donation button underneath that. That so hard work. I really hope you get some expenses covered. Well, people have been have been uh, responding reasonably well. So good. Uh, also, um, I have a seminar at the end of November on esoteric astrology and the hidden history of of uh, humanity in a weekend in Sweden near North. Shop. What's the date? Uh, the date's the 24th to the 26th from Friday evening through to Sunday. Of October? No, of November. November. Okay, I think we'll get this out before. If you, if you, go, to, if you go to my website, esotericastrologer.org, there's a heading called uh, Seminars, I think. And if you click on that, you'll get all the details there about... Um, okay. At that particular seminar in uh, in Sweden, close to Stockholm, or in two hours south of Stockholm, and, okay. and about thirty minutes drive from New Shopping Airport, which is the plane you, the airport you need to go to to uh, if you're coming from anywhere in Europe. I thought New so, Köping was in Denmark. Excuse me. I thought New Köping was in Denmark, but it's New in... Shopping. New Shopping and North Shopping are both in Sweden. There may be one in in Denmark, but. Okay. If you go to the my website, esotericastrologer.org, to a heading called Courses, and underneath that, click on Seminars, and you'll find all the details about this weekend. Don't you offer any education online? I have done in the past, but I've been very busy in the last three or four years. So, uh, But I intend to uh, run webinars extensively after this book comes out. So they will be by donation. Um, people can attend. The only prerequisite that they need is the uh, copy of the new book to go by, and I'll be I'll be running through the whole book, exploring the book, and um, 
people can, uh, you know, learn from that as, as we go. But will there be more parts of the video? Oh, yes, um, there will be. I, I plan to have another video coming out, not in the, in the, in the too distant future, maybe a few years, and uh, other books and videos over the, you know, for the next 20 years. <laughs> I, I do have a lot of plans. Uh, but you know, you, you operate like a true situation in a big time scale. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe I get to some of them, maybe I don't. But I regard this rewrite that I've just put out of Unva Unveiling Genesis okay. as um, a synthesis of my original book and more and much better presented and much easier to follow than the previous one. So I'm quite excited about sharing that with people and exploring it through subsequent webinars. Yeah. Cool. So, and um, obviously, if people, if you donate, it goes a long way to finance further projects like this. Absolutely. So that's good. Anyway, you've donated your time and expertise to us today, of which we are very appreciative. So, uh, just many thanks to you for coming on. Uh, thanks so much, Al. Again. I really appreciate you inviting me to to be able to share all this and. Uh... Hopefully we can have a chat again sometime. Yes, indeed. There's so much to explore here. But you've got a taste now, people. So hope that is giving appetites for more. Very well, uh, Philip. Very good. Great talking to you. Yeah, yeah you too. Thanks, Thanks so much, much. Al. So, so all the best, uh, Philip. Thank, thank you for coming on. on. Okay, man. Okay, Cheers for now. Bye. 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 Thus far today, as a postscript, I'll read you selected quotes from the book of Xi'an. But first, remember to support us in any way you can. Donations go a long way. But there's also other ways to help out. Many of you know that YouTube's new owners are cracking down on all forms of independent media and transitioning YouTube to become an online platform for the dying old stream media in a vain hope that this will save them. Half our programs are now casualties of that war and has been demonetized. So if you deactivate adblock, on our channel and let the ads play on those that still retain them. This will help our budget. YouTube is also burying videos with system critical content. But if you like our videos, if you click on the like button, thumbs up, this will increase their visibility. And of course, also if you share them on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or other social platforms, it counteracts the indirect censoring. If you subscribe to both our YouTube channels, this gives us technical opportunities and advantages lacking today that can help us become more effective and increase our production pace. The larger amount of subscribers, the better off we are. And finally, if you want to contribute helping us out with video making, research or other tasks, just contact us via the website. That's also where our sponsors go to find unreleased shows months, months before they are published at the Tube. But you have to sign up and log in to access them and the bonus stuff there. Finally, let's listen to some stanzas from the book of Gion, this old Atlantean fragment. Then all men became endowed with a manas. They saw the sin of the mindless. The fourth race developed speech. The one became two. Also all the living and creeping things that were still one. Giant fish, birds and serpents with shell heads. Thus Two by two, on the seven zones, the third race gave birth to the fourth. The Sura became our Sura. The first seven human shoots were all of one complexion. The next seven began mixing. Then the third and fourth became tall with pride. We are the kings, we are the gods. They took wives fair to look upon, wives from the mindless, 
They bred monsters, wicked demons, male and female, also Kado, with little minds. They built temples for the human body, male and female they worshipped. Then the third eye acted no longer. They built huge cities, of rare earths and metals they built. Out of the fires vomited, out of the white stone of the mountains and of the black stone, they cut their own images in their size and likeness and worshipped them. They built great images, nine yachts high, the size of their bodies. Inner fires had destroyed the land of their fathers, the water threatened the fourth. The first great waters came, they swallowed the seven great islands. All holy saved, the unholy destroyed. With them, most of the huge animals produced from the seat of the earth. Few remained, some yellow, some brown and black, and some red remained. The moon colored were gone forever. The fifth produced from the holy stock remained. It was ruled over by the first divine kings. The serpents who redescended, who made peace with the fifth, who taught and instructed it. And that's it. Thank you for listening to Forum Borealis. As ever, your host has been Al. Thanks, Thanks to, to the, the team. team. And our patterns. Be seeing you. Who is number one?